Um, I'd like to call the second night of the budget committee meeting to order. Um, <clears throat> at this time, we will reopen the City of North Bend budget committee meeting on May 17th and continue the approval process of the fiscal year 2023, which starts in July. Uh, the first item of business is to open up for public comment. Does anyone wish to speak? Please be advised your time is limited to five minutes. City recorder, do we have anyone signed up to provide public testimony? We do not. Okay. Um, anybody? Okay, I will close the public comment portion of this meeting and staff will, will present responses to the committee's questions from last night. And then we'll deliberate. All right, thank you and good evening. Um, Sorry. Oh. Okay, good evening. So I have prepared responses to all of the questions received from last night and tried to capture uh, as best I could from your notes. So if I miss anything, please let us know. We're happy to answer any new questions this evening as well. Um, the first one is related to franchise fees. And the question was, how can the city make up this lost revenue due to cutting the cord? Is there a Wi-Fi franchise fee or something similar? So we already have franchise fees with many um, internet providers. The issue comes when, you know, maybe somebody has cable service and they have internet service. So when they move to just streaming, they're eliminating one of those services. So where they had two franchise fees they were paying for before, and now they're just paying for one. So those, those internet providers are already paying us franchise fees for using our rights of way. Um, the other um, example that I gave last night was of folks moving from landlines to cell phones only. So because those cell phone providers, they're not using our rights of way. They don't have any infrastructure in our rights of way. Uh, and that's the difference. So if we, we basically charge rent for them to use our right of way. So as a, a cell phone provider, they're towers. So they don't have anything in our rights of way to uh, for us to be charging rent on. So one or two talk a little more about that. Um, I don't know if there's any follow-up question to that or if that makes sense, answers the so question. To be clear, the right-of-way is the physical right-of-way on the land only. So satellite, any, anything delivered Wi-Fi is not the purpose. Correct. So if, uh, like I said, for uh, cell phone providers, they have cell towers that maybe they lease the land that they're on. So whoever they're leasing the land from benefits from that, mm -hmm. but there's no way for us to collect a franchise fee because they're not using our rights of way. Okay. Uh, the next question is, does the school district still pay half of the school resource officer position? Yes, they do, um, plus a 50% tip. Uh, so the city has an intergovernmental agreement, also referred to as an IGA, uh, with the North Bend School District. The current agreement expires June 30th of 2023, so at the end of this fiscal year budget, uh, but specifies that the school district pay 100% of that particular position. Um, this includes their wages and benefits, uh, and it's approximately $132,200 that the city receives for this. So that revenue is in the public safety fund. <clears throat> Do we have an agency to pursue uncollected taxes? So the Coos County tax collector or the treasurer collects those unpaid taxes um, each year. So we anticipate not collecting the full taxes every year um, because there's always uh, some properties that are delinquent, but we do eventually collect that tax. It just might be a year later, a couple of years later. So the tax collector collects those and then they get forwarded on to us in the, the year that they're collected. Um, those are charged interest. So if you pay late, you pay interest on it, um, but it is eventually collected at the time that the property transfers ownership. Uh, right in line with that, why is the uncollected property tax $286,000? So if you look in the appendix on page 143, there's um, kind of a worksheet of how we anticipate what we're gonna collect in taxes each year. So we take, 
what's imposed, what what if we collected 100% of the taxes, what that amount would be, and then we apply um, an uncollected rate. And so historically, taking a five-year average, that rate has been just over 6%. So this year we took that full imposed taxes uh, and removed 6% of it. That's the $286,000 that we don't expect to collect this year. But as I just mentioned in the slide before, eventually we will collect it as property ship property ownership transfers in the future, could be in a year, could be in five years. The exception would be is if a property is foreclosed on, then we may not collect uh, those taxes at that point. What do we do about the issue around assessed value? What can we do to increase this revenue? And what is this city council, city management doing um, related to that? So I left this a little open-ended, but it is addressed at the state level. Um, and the city is represented by League of Oregon Cities and League does uh, a lot of our lobbying, but I would open that one up to the city administrator who can probably speak a little more clearly on it. So the, in fact, uh, Mayor Klingelke is actually on the uh, board of the League of Cities, um, as is uh, uh, Councilman uh, Slater, who's a past president. And so collectively, uh, that executive board comes together and they formulate a legislative policy uh, working with all of the local governments. And then the league has uh, specific lobbyists that go after the legislate uh, and lobby on behalf of the local government. Very much like the Chamber of Commerce has its legislative action team uh, for which um, one of your committee members, Ron Cooch, um, heads that up for the chamber and they represent the lobby for businesses. And then on the county side, the Association of County Commissioners, uh, they go out and they also lobby. And sometimes we jointly lobby on issues, for instance, like homelessness. And so you have state laws here that one entity um, cannot make a difference. We, we have state law and you can buck that law, but until you can get the majority of the legislators in Salem to do a wholesale change to taxation in the state, which you do not, they talk about every year. <laughs> it just is not occurring. <laughs> and so if and when it does, we'll benefit. Right now, this city is very much like others. We're stronghold. Um, one of the first things you do when you come to the state is you have to really learn about taxation. Uh, unless we have new development, new uh, uh, substantial uh, uh, development on properties or new development, um, we only get an incremental amount of taxes that come in. And so yesterday you saw the exact amount of what comes in. So yes, I'll be the first to say, um, if you talk to tax assessors, they'll tell you it's the fairest, you know, and it's a good system. Talk to local governments, um, that's all great until you go out and you buy or have built an eight or $900,000 home. And so it doesn't matter that someone down the street just sold their house for 600,000. If that house is 80 years old, they're locked in. And so there is indeed that disproportionate of taxation versus services. 60% of the services the city provides comes from taxes, your property taxes. So in fact, it's less than 60%, um, but it's rounded. And um, what that means is that we have to figure out how to come up. And so you use the franchise fees and other fees for services, and then you augment that with grants. So in this case, um, the assessed value uh, we continue to uh, lobby, and we do lobby for uh, tax reform. Uh, right now, there's an initiative uh, on the coast, for instance, um, trying to uh, assemble uh, the cities, the coastal cities, so that we experience um, the greater portion of tourism. And so uh, they would like to see if the tourism, the transient uh, lodging tax, be altered some so that we can use that, for instance, on our local roads. Um, so there's constantly this juggle at the state house on how to deal with taxation. All right, thank you. 
Another question, why is the unfun, un, unappropriated ending fund balance, been a long day, only 20% when it is expected to cover one third of the year's expenses? So there's a formula to calculate what this percentage should be, but the short answer is that we receive other revenues during those first few months, um, such as franchise fees, planning fees, rental fees, business license fees, contract revenue, revenue sharing, uh, so we don't need to roll over a full one third from uh, the prior year to cover July through October. Based on historical trend, it's been around 18 to 21 percent is what we need to carry over. And so here you can see a representation of, of property taxes, as David mentioned, is about 58 percent of our revenues. The other is 42 percent. Just I think I've got that backwards. Preserved. It looks like the numbers are flipped. Yeah. So I was just going to say it's backwards. Um, the other 42 percent is all those other revenues. So we do have other revenues that come in monthly or quarterly during that time. And then the bulk of our, our revenues come in in November. But yes, I apologize, that's flip-flopped. Please provide an example of what reserves would be used for. So in the fire equipment fund, um, this money is saved specifically for fire equipment, just as the title says. So saving for fire apparatus, engines, vehicles, and other equipment, it's specific to capital purchases. In the PERS reserve fund, this is um, money set aside per resolution 3024, and these funds are to pay all or part of the PERS retirement plan. So these are or personnel costs. And we'll talk a little bit more specifically about PERS uh, at the end of these slides. And then when we talk about our new emergency reserve fund, so these are funds set aside for uh, use during maybe a budget deficit, uh, revenue shortfall, economic downturn, a catastrophic event like a fire, earthquake, tsunami, an unanticipated significant capital purchase. Um, a good example here would be, let's say we had to move the senior center into the community building. Well, we know that community need, building needs significant um, work to the, the structure. So we would have this emergency reserve if we had to do something at the last second to repair that building to be able to move the senior center. Another example would be if a fire broke out in one of our, our buildings and we lost some equipment until we got that insurance money in, we'd be able to purchase, uh, replace that capital equipment. And then one of the other things I wanted to note here is um, because this is a new fund and typically you have a reserve policy, uh, we'll work towards establishing that in fiscal year 23 and that'll better define how that money is used. And for clarity, this is the roughly $1 million. Correct. That is, um, <laughs> Transferring from general fund, yes. Who determines the capital outlay, the $1 million? So again, this is re referring to that emergency reserve fund. And in the current budget, so we wanted to move that money out of the general fund and into its standalone budget. And for the time being, the way that it's um, broken down in the budget is to some capital costs. So I think there's equipment, motor vehicles, improvements, a few different line items. And these are simply just placeholders. Um, if we had to go and use this money, spend this money, it would have to go to the city council and they would have to authorize it. So it could be that, you know, maybe we'd have to go and say, we need to do a transfer to the general fund because we're short on revenues this year. So it's not necessarily that those line items are how that money is going to be used. It's just those are placeholders for the time being. So I think the other thing to note is that if we don't have this money, we would have to borrow it to, to run the city. And so that's one of the reasons that we always want to keep some, you know, some uh, rainy day. yeah, rainy day money. Because even if you could get a decent rate to borrow, it's still better to have your own money to borrow from. Yeah, but if you think about it, a million dollars and all that much. No, that's not very much. You're exactly right. And I think that was one of my questions was, how did we determine a million? Where did that come from? And why isn't it 1.5 million? Or why isn't it 2 million? Or yeah. So that's what the reserve policy will start to identify is what should that amount be right now, this is just what was in excess in the general fund so we've moved it out of there and then now we can start defining how do we use it, how much should we have, how do we replace it if we use it. And that's determined by who? That'll come to council, council would have to authorize it, it'd be a resolution. Okay. And that money was normally 
It wasn't in contingency, it was in some other fund. So this is at the end of our fiscal year 20 audit. Um, the beginning, right. yeah, the beginning working capital was lower than what the actuals came in. So we had this about a million dollars more than what came in over the budget. So we were able to stick within our budget and then we had the surplus to carry over to the next year. If we left it in the general fund, would it, what kind of heading would we keep it up for? It just is a single line item. It said reserve for future expenditure. So this allows us to move it into a fund and have multiple line items within it to identify is it going to be used for personnel costs, capital costs? How how are we going to split it up? I view the moving into a fund separate as a as a way to create an accountability mm -hmm. transparency process. Yes, um, it can be. It, it's it specifically says this is a special place. This is a placeholder. We will develop the policy and use it. So it's a way to hold all parties accountable and transparent and have discussions. Absolutely. Well, what I mean is if it's if it's truly um, an emergency fund that there should it should be for we have an earthquake and we've left lost water service um, mm -hmm. not for a special building projects or something like that. Mm -hmm. and I, I saw that there's like eight hundred thousand dollars that's earmarked for construction. Sure. So the example of a fire, say the parks shop burned down. Well, we would have to wait on that insurance money. Having money available to rebuild right away allows us to start sooner than waiting on an insurance claim, but then we would replace that money into the emergency reserve fund. So construction projects is 800,000. And again, these are just placeholders. It's not based on anything. Okay. So they were just yeah, initial placeholders. Okay. And Jessica, in, in the past budget, like the items that are listed here, um, if that, that we're moving forward now with this emergency fund that's established, those typical items would have come out of contingency? Yeah, um, or uh, because we had the $907,000 in reserves in fiscal year 22, if an emergency came up, there is a process for being able to appropriate that money. Currently as a reserve, it's not available for being spent, but it has to be a significant, uh, unanticipated, catastrophic mm -hmm. reason to be able to appropriate that. So would it be fair to say that you have, you know, you have your unknowns and then you have, so these are sort of like the planned unknowns? Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> unknown. like, no, I know something will break at my house this year. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Right. But, but you've sure. got a, a, like, a reserve for it. Yeah. Wood. Well, and that's kind of how contingency is used as well. But the difference there is that contingency can be used during the year much easier than your reserve is intended for more long-term uh, planning or savings. Okay. So it's easier to use contingency money during the year than it is to appropriate the reserve money. Would, if we used some of that, would we, have to, we wouldn't have to do a supplemental budget to move money around at the end of the year? For contingency? For either, I guess. For, res, for the reserve, you would have to do a budget amendment. And that's why I say it has to be a, you have to justify, I mean, this is based on local budget law. You have to justify that it's like something completely unknown at the time of putting the budget together. Like it's a catastrophic out of the blue event and you have to use that money. So, so by way, Madam Chair, um, you know, there's this misnomer that, you know, and, and you've heard the word catastrophic multiple times. Um, when things hit the fan, the government is not going to come to us and immediately hand us checks. It doesn't work that way. If you talk to anyone that's had a catastrophic fire or a tornado, um, it is often days uh, before initial aid. And then it is months, if not even longer, before they're doling out checks, okay? If this government uh, has a catastrophic um, event, we need to be able to uh, get access to cash. And so this is just that. This is like your most securest rainy day fund that you hope you never have to touch. But it's not um, if, it's when. You will have to touch this at some point, um, whether it's a major flood, uh, whether it's a tsunami, whether it's an earthquake, whether it's a fire. And so 
I think we're getting caught up on how does it get moved, budgets, things like that. You know, there is no designated plan to spend this money. Um, a roof is something that you know in 20 years you're going to act up. So we account for that in our budget. This is, we are putting it in, hoping that we don't have to use it, but we know at some point it's going to have to get used because all governments at some point have an unknown, unforeseen disaster or something of that nature. And so um, if you ask our police and fire, they'll tell you that in a catastrophic, um, you need more than just a week's supply. Uh, you need uh, 30 days or more uh, because they're not going to be here. Um, it's going to be us, your local government. And so if we don't have access to resources to take care of our local government and be able to be operational. And so that's what this is. She is creating and we're glad that we're able to do this is to put this and set up this emergency fund that we hope that we never have to use, but will at some point. David, could you speak please to what we typically use um, contingency funds for? I'm just not. Oh, absolutely. Sometimes you will have an absolute unforeseen cost on a project. Um, we've had a couple uses of contingency. Um, Jessica will gladly, you know, spell out those. But when you budget something, and uh, <coughs> let's say that we have a pump station go down, uh, and we only have so much money that we've set aside, and you have to replace it, you got to either find it in the budget. We have to go to contingency um, to address that. Um, a police car, um, you know, loses its entire back end. We didn't plan for that. Those things are easier for contingency. Um, and you sort of kind of plan for some form of contingency. Um, maybe that roof gets there faster than, than we thought, and we have to address it. All right, so like I said, a million dollars isn't a lot. Mm -hmm. Is this going to grow? Or do That's what the reserve to get it to something that actually would do something. That's what the reserve policy would set to spell out. Like, how much do we need to have based on certain criteria? So that'll be the next step of things. Yes. What? <clears throat> Just along that line, do we see any, any, um, particular funds in our budget that are invested with the LGIP, the local government investment pool, or is that is that something that would funds in our budget here? Are those some of those monies already invested in LGIP? The bulk of our money, so all of these funds combined is in LGIP. We keep okay. just a small amount in our general operating account for payroll and whatnot, and we transfer in as we need it. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I want to add that uh, maybe it's the word emergency, and it, and it can be a, a bunch of things. It makes me think of the time at the college where we had a couple of three different scenarios. We had a, a former president that spent down our ending fund balance, bought some property, and then 2008-9, and the state just stopped paying us, uh, and then our tuition fee revenue went down. You know, so we had these couple of three things and, and we were out of cash. We got a million dollar payroll every month, you know, so we, we laid some people off. Sure, like everybody did, but there's still, you know, there's still kind of that minimum. Like, what does it take? What do we have to pay to keep the city running? You know, and, and these are the kinds of things that I mean, the college, we have that now. Right. And because of that time, a dozen years ago, like our ending fund balances, I don't know, it's like. 10 times what it was then, I mean, you know, cause we were going to Wells Fargo and borrowing money to make payroll, you know? So I'm like, emergency can be a, a lot of different things. And, and it wasn't for us, it wasn't one catastrophic thing. It was a couple of dominoes, you know, that got us into that position. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that were, you know, that would that control something like that? I mean, that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. And again, I think until we have a policy to set out, you know, specifically what we're going to use that money on. You know, like maybe what he's talking about, like what, what should it be? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Discovering what it should be. Yeah. For now, it's just a matter of getting in its own fund so that we can, again, be more transparent about the accounting of it. Okay. I'm going to move on to the next one. 
Um, what is the lifespan of a fire engine, the years, miles, et cetera? So I reached out to Chief Brown about this. Um, so I don't know if you would like to speak on it or you want me just to read your slide and, and any questions you can follow up. Uh, so the National Fire Protection Association recommends that a fire engine is put into reserve status after 15 years, then out of service after 20, depending on condition. With our aggressive maintenance program and the quality of vehicles we have purchased in the past, we're comfortable adding five years to each category. So after 20 years, it's placed into reserve status and at 25, it's end of life. This has been adopted by the city council in our fire apparatus replacement plan. And the current ages of our fire engines are one at eight years, one at 19 years, one at 21, which that particular one is having some electrical issues. And the ladder truck is at 27 years. Uh, there's annual testing that must be completed to be uh, to be certain a fire engine still meets NFPA standards. And uh, I duplicated the, uh, there's a replacement plan. So there's an adopted plan uh, for purchasing new uh, equipment. So there's a schedule for that replacement. I don't know if that answers that question for everyone. Um, so this is just a clarification. So one of the things that happened is allocated to our various departments is that those department heads all have um, at least a short list of things that need to be replaced, capital costs. And so a little bit of our money, or maybe a lot, but a little bit goes into these savings plans for our departments. Um, so we are saving on a yearly basis for these large things that we anticipate. Yeah. So like last, yeah, last night we talked about the general fund transferred $45,000 to this particular fund, the equipment replacement fund. We do that annually to save um, based on that adopted purchasing plan. And so if I may, Mr. Come on, I was going to say real quick with it. One of my not particular fund, fire truck and reserve fund, we've been putting our 45 uh, When the council decided to go ahead and purchase the fire engine, there was $180,000 that actually came out of the equipment reserve fund and went basically as a down payment on the, on our fire engine. So that was right into the plan of what we had going, putting 45000 in. We were able to put that 180000 directly on, knock down the price. And, and then helped out that way. Knocked on the price, knocked on any loan you had to take. Exactly. Really, exactly. Well done. Excellent. Yeah. And that's that's just like what you were saying. We're planning ahead for the future in a lot of different cases. Fire engines is just one. And there's a lot of different things that we're, we're planning for the future as well. Thank you. That's safe. I've gone around in your rescue trucks, but you know, because you see the years as to what you're doing and, so, and why. So. And, and obviously keep an eye on that 27 year ladder truck. Um, when they do the testing, they're amazed that that actually even passes. We have underwriters laboratory come in. So we, we get the best quality we can. And there's two choices they can do a, they call it a non-destructive or destructive. I don't like the choice of those words, but, um, and the non-destructive is much more in depth. And we have that done every year because of the age. They actually, Mag, they, they do a lot of extra work to the ladder to be sure it's really sound. And we're still meeting, exceeding the standards that are put into place. And so it's all going great for us at this time, but they are truly, they're saying this is one of the oldest ones that we actually do tests on that, that do as well as they, they do. And we just take very, very good care of all our stuff because we really, really, we know the importance of all of this. So 27 years old, that's, that's getting a little, it's dog years. So it's, it's getting pretty old in, in, uh, in, in ladder truck years. Uh, so just, just because this is mostly about the money, I think I, I just want to take a moment to recognize that this is the quality of work we're getting from our public servants mm -hmm. all the way down the chain. And um, I hope that's news and I thank you for it. We really feel an extra feeling of responsibility and, and we really are proud of what we can do with what we have. So Chief Brown, you... Yes. You purchased or purchasing a new truck. Yes. And will that replace one of these or will that be an addition? Yes, that will replace the one that's 21 years old at this time. Having some electrical concerns. Yeah, it, it's it, it's time. It is. I, I could go time. on for quite a while, but, but the short story is yes, replacing that one. And it's definitely needed at this point. So you have a plan for the ladder truck when it doesn't pass the inspection? 
No, we're, no, we're, we're, we're working on. <laughs> we, we've got a plan. Contingency place, fund. It's, it's kind of in the the the. It's in the works of being developed. Okay. And and just as a footnote, I'll throw this one out there. Um, our assistant chief, he went back to uh, and went through some specialized class in ladder trucks and how to determine ladder trucks. And it's kind of a technical thing, but it, it was really good to, for him to get a good grasp on those. The cost of these ladder trucks, we think the fire engines are expensive. These ladder trucks are going up crazy. Um, when we bought ours, it was a demo unit. My memory tells me we paid around 300,000. We'll just say that's close to what it was at that time in 1995. We're talking a million and a half now at this point, and they're not slowing down. Um, when I was speaking to Mr. Waddington, he said, plan on 1.8 maybe, because it's, it's not going, and, and it's just silly, the cost. That's, that's the reason it was such a great thing. We were able to get this fire engine coming and saving the amount of money we did. It, it's great. So I mean, just like everything is going up as much as it is, but ladder trucks are definitely a necessity and they're not getting any cheaper. Maybe you could talk to Ralph about another loan and get one before they went too, yeah, trust yeah. too right. far. We're working them over pretty good. And I, I was going to say in the meantime, when you walk by the fire department, like give it a little kiss, say a little prayer, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. all the things. Yeah. Yeah. Ralph's still recovering from yeah. the current event. So we'll let him recover a little bit. I'm dead. <laughs> however, uh, however, and Ron, I knew that that, that was meant tongue in cheek because what you learned yesterday is there's going to get a point where Rob can't loan anymore. Yeah. His infrastructure is so far behind and there's not enough revenue coming in for his. And so it's underground. Folks don't see it. But, but you heard the report yesterday that at some point we're going to have to address. We have the lowest. Uh, uh, sanitary sewer fees on the coast so low that the federal government will not give us grants hmm. because they don't feel that we are stressed. Our budget is stressed, okay, but they don't feel that the taxpayers are stressed and need that assistance. So we actually were turned down hmm. from the federal government to be able to get any money for our sanitary sewer system. So those are things that staff is working through, and that's why we continue to educate the governing body. And so when you heard yesterday, that's critical because Ralph has to continue to replace sanitary sewer because it's also getting near end of life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it's surprising when you, you know, get to the next slide, which I think are the police guards. So that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. And as promised, what is the lifespan for police cars, years, miles, etc.? cetera? Uh, Chief McCullough provided a response here. Typically the lifespan for a shared vehicle used for patrol duties is about six years and 100,000 to 120,000 miles. Prior administration assigned out cars to individual officers. This is why we currently have had patrol cars that are eight to 12 years old that are under 100,000 miles and are or were no longer safe to drive and mechanically expensive to keep on the road. Administration and investigation cars, those typically last much longer due to the fact that they are not used as hard as vehicles assigned to patrol. So, Chief, anything to add there? <clears throat> with, the, with the current uh, status of the patrol fleet, uh, that was one of the things that Captain Mitz and I evaluated when we first got here on direction from the city administrator. And uh, we did find that, I mean, we're spending an exorbitant amount of money on maintenance on trying to keep these older cars. Um, when I say older, I mean, they're um, eight to 12 years old, but they don't have the typical mileage put on them that um, when you go to surplus them, that um, people feel comfortable because, uh, I'm sure most of you folks, you know, use your personal cars and you get as much as you can out of them and 120, 150, 200,000 miles. It's just, you can't get that out of a patrol vehicle, the way they're operated. Uh, the idle time where they sit and just idle is very hard on the motors. And, and then they I sit there and idle and then you get a hot call and an officer jumps in it and slams and they're, they're off and running and it's just uh, very difficult. So what we're trying to do is get into that, um, 
patrol car replacement schedule um, that um, after about six years and then start looking and hopefully we can get it to where we can replace, you know, after this, we're getting uh, thankful to everybody in this room. <coughs> we're able to, we have some money that we're able to replace some of those older patrol cars. We get those new ones that in about, you know, five or six years, we'll start looking and trying to get into that rotation where we'll be rotating, you know, one or two of them every year. So we're not trying to have to buy six or eight of them all at one time. So that's kind of the plan with that. So, so Chief, last last week I was enlightened because one of the new patrol cars was sitting out locked up and idling. And after asking the question, like, why is this thing running? He told me that it was because the computer system has to boot up and if you have it shut off and you have, like you said, a hot call, you've got to wait for all that stuff to boot up to actively work when before you take off. Correct. Yeah. So sure it's kind of like having a fire engine plugged in, you know, warmed up, ready to go on a, on a fire call. So yeah. that's just adding, you know, hours and hours and hours of idle time on these vehicles. They may not look old. And they but, may not have a lot of miles on them, but they've run forever. Yeah. So yeah, they're kind of continuous. And, that, and I did not know that. That was something that I just learned. <laughs> yeah. Because it seemed like a waste of money to have something out there running. Yeah. But they can be <laughs> resold, right? Pardon me? They can be resold. Yes. Yeah. And you know, so I is mean, that in the equation? Um, it is. Yeah. We just sold two of the um, ones we surplus to uh, actually to Myrtle Point Police Department. Um, where they can get some more use out of them. Uh, I think we sold two of them for about five thousand dollars. So, and that money goes, I'm assuming, goes back into the major capital for further expenses. If we got four of them out there now, two of the the chargers are are really rough. So, I'm trying to find some place a home for those and and different things. So, but the other thing we've done is gone to a shared, going back to a shared vehicle. <clears throat> to where we're like I explained last last night were four different shifts so when a, and two of them are day shifts two of them are night shifts when one day shifts on the other one's on their days off so that day shift person will use that car and then when he goes off his day shifts then that guy that's coming on on day shifts that's going to share that car he will continue so they're not run 24 seven, they're run seven days a week, but they're not run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So, and that way we can get the mileage up when it comes time uh, in that, you know, six year period that we got the, the mileage on them as well as the, the uh, year on them, years. Chief, we first of all, welcome. And thank you for coming over from the dark side. Um, <laughs> Were these previously not shared? No, they were individually assigned out to an officer. So they they had their own personal car and they, they went home with them and then I sat there on their days off and, and came in. But they, you, um, especially recently, as you, as you know, we don't make near as many trips to Coquille as we has, have in the past, All, you know, transport. Because people. it doesn't do any good. So. Yeah. <laughs> So um, they, they just weren't getting the mileage on. Like there's two of them um, that are sitting over there in the lot now that are, I want to say they're 2011s and they got under a hundred thousand miles on them, but the suspensions are shot, the motors are shot and just so. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next one is regarding the community center. Uh, funds were pulled for the community center. What are we doing to keep it from falling down? What is the long-term plan for it? The funds pulled from uh, pulled from the community center budget were one-time federal dollars. So that was the uh, coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds. Unfortunately, this is not the only municipal building needing repairs. The city council needed to make good on its promise to voters to fix the pool's aging infrastructure. The library, city hall, visitors, information center, and community center all need substantial repairs. It will not be long before the central fire station also needs significant upgrades and repairs. The community center is 
only eligible for federal CDBG grant funds if it used if it's used for senior or homeless needs in the community. The city council has authorized its use as a senior center should the Coos County Airport District opt to cancel or make cost prohibitive lease agreements on the current facility. Possible options for the community center might include raising rental fees to market rates, disposing of the facility, creating a pri public private partnership to independently operate the facility in exchange for making repairs, asking voters to approve a recreation levy that would encompass the pool, community building, and community parks, or repurposing the facility as a senior center. Is there anything additional, well, the staff or the committee? This was members? my question. You know, there's mushrooms growing out the side of that building. And when we were- I'd be surprised. <laughs> when, when I was here two years ago, I asked, the same question what are we going to do with the community center and, and the answer was oh we have a plan for the community center well here we are two years later and it's that site is going to fall off of there pretty soon there's mushrooms and you can push on the site and and i understand every, everything needs maintenance but that's not going to last much longer folks it's not going to yeah your your point's very valid and uh some of these other buildings, uh, for instance, uh, the building we're in right now, we know that there is a seismic study on it that says that if we were to have an earthquake, um, this building is not sustainable and we'll all be pretty much touched. Um, that is the stage. That's the reality of where we are financially. And so as a budget committee um, and, and staff, we go through and pour through the budget trying to figure out and address council's priorities. We have a library. You just saw the Coos uh, uh, Bay library levy go down in smoke, down in flames, whatever you want to say. Um, and that building is sinking, okay? And it is leaking and their employees are operating. When cities engaged with the library district, the city was on the hook for the building. So for instance, we have a plan for the library. We have plans for all of our buildings. We just don't have money for them. And so in the case of the library, um, I will tell you that as city administrator, I've asked uh, that we back off on what was the original expansion of that building. And instead let's focus on taking care of the envelope and let's shore up that building so that we can get 20 years out of it. Uh, because unfortunately that million dollars doesn't go far. I could take that same million dollars and throw it at the community building if the council said do that. Um, but I then still need some more money to finish it because it's more than a million dollar project. Um, just the renovation of the kitchen alone uh, is a very substantial costly endeavor. So you're absolutely right. Um, every single year, um, we have to ask those questions. We're very fortunate. I woke up this morning and the one thing I said to my wife was um, private conversation, but you know, the two dogs were listening, so I'll share it with you, was that, um, you know, I'm sort of blessed and I didn't realize it at the time, but I realize it now. I realize the importance of the pool to this community because when you start to look at a lot of these bond initiatives and things that have occurred in the year and a half I've been here, North Bend overwhelmingly passed those. And, and that's critical. And so that's why the focus has been on that building. Meanwhile, uh, we are moving forward with the library building. We're putting lipstick on the visitor center while we try to resolve where we go with that. The, the community center, um, we had put money in that fund and had planned to start some work, but at the same point, the escalation of the pool, and once you started to scratch and sniff and pull things apart, the cost started going through the roof. We originally asked for a grant fund for those three major things at 375,000, okay? And so as you've heard from your finance director here, just some of the things like the insurance cost and things, these are not made up numbers, you're experiencing. Every state right now in the nation has no less than $4 a gallon gas. So the cost is real. And so, yes, I went here two years ago when you sat, 
because I've only been here a year and a half. There is a plan. We actually have plans. All we need is money. And so that's why we, um, you see here, there's ways to get federal funds. And um, the community has said, no homeless. And so we have engaged with the senior center. We have uh, invited them to show them. That's not their first option. They feel that they'd be a little more overwhelming. So then we've started on plan B, which is potentially that public-private partnership, but at the same time, trying to figure out how to preserve rentals because that's the lower cost rental. There's a lot of connectivity to folks who have gotten married there, had problems there, have gone to events, you know, the old union hall. So that's, you know, when, when folks say we want to run for city council, those are the tough decisions that's on your shoulders to make is we bring you plans. How are you going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. Especially when your property taxes are limited. So. And it was a tough decision, but I think I can probably all of the council that are here and online that the pool was the priority. We had to make the decision that we have to get the pool open. All right. Well, I'm coming back in two years. So let's With see what, what you can get. <laughs> you pay for it. Grab a hammer. Is it is it possible to have volunteers repair that? We have a volunteer. In fact, yes. Um, uh, we've been approached by an entity that you know, um, uh, potentially could do a public-private partnership. And that's why I sort of dabble in these. These aren't just things we make up. These are conversations we have at different points, um, but we have not committed because, you know, um, the, 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 the previous slide where it's like, you, you've heard the senior center come up twice. The lease on the senior center is on airport property and the airport has asserted that they now own that building that the taxpayers and the federal dollars paid for. Those are things that will work through. That lease expires June 30th. We've asked for a renewal. We've asked for, say, a five-year tenure because there was no renewal clause put in the one year. We had a one-year short lease. The council's aware of it. And so we, we have intentionally held on to the community building for lack of better, bringing any options to the council until we knew what was going to happen with that building. Maybe a showdown, I don't know. But I do know the senior center folks are going to the meeting, I believe, at the airport tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Feel free to join them because they want to know what's going on too, just as we do. Because um, this city and the taxpayers gave that land, but we don't have enough time to go delve in all that. The council's aware of it. So those are things that we are working on. And so, yes, you're right. That building, because it was COVID, we weren't renting it out. So we weren't giving it any TLC and we didn't have money. We, we basically do the absolute minimum we can um, because it only generates, I think, roughly about 10,000 profit, give or take, a year right now. So. In a year that it's operating. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Perfect. Okay. I don't want to sound defensive. It's just the reality. I mean, we all deal with our own budgets and we all have to make our own priorities. So the day that you have to buy a brand new car, I, I, I pray for everybody, myself included, because I don't fit small cars. <laughs> Another you. deferred building maintenance question. So discuss deferred maintenance and what plan we have in place. So I think this was just addressed. Uh, it comes back down to um, revenue. We don't have a whole lot of, of capital reserves. We have a little bit in our fire equipment fund. Uh, we have pool capital set aside, um, but it comes down to needing to generate more revenue in order to take care of some of that deferred maintenance. So it's City Administrator said we have plans. We're in the process of creating a capital improvement program, but that doesn't generate the money needed to make those improvements. That's my item. So I'm wondering, you know, council, is, is this something that you expect to have next year? You know, have have this capital improvement plan? It's a it's a council goal. So staff okay. would be the one to implement the program, and we've started that. Uh, 
by starting to develop what those capital items are, and then we'll put together a program that identifies timeline for needing to complete those projects, cost for those projects, what are the revenue sources for those projects, um, what is the prior prioritization for those projects. So it's a planning tool, but again, it it doesn't it might help us to identify some of the revenues, some of the resources, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have that on hand to do those projects yet. So it's a step in the right direction. <laughs> How are the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds dispersed all at once in the past? Do they trickle in? Where are they now? So to date, the city has received half of the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, also known as the ARPA money. Uh, this is $1,084,200, and the second tranche is anticipated to come in around August. Portion of these funds has already been spent and that's in accordance to the city's adopted spending plan. So council authorized this in December and then just recently revised it a week or two ago. So we'll take a look at that on the next slide. And as of today, about $360,000 has been expended of this money. And you can see here that that's for a community survey, hazard payments, transfer to the pool improvement fund and a transfer to the equipment construction fund for police cars. Uh, and so these, these funds are expended, either they're a direct charge to the fund or they're a transfer out to other funds and then spent in those funds. Just for clarification, that 1,084,000, is that half that's half due? Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll get that same amount in August. Okay. Um, so you can see here, this is the spending plan. At the top is the community center. So we reallocated that money from the original plan. This is the revised plan. Uh, there's $40,000 set aside for three years each for community events. This is um, transferred to the transient room tax fund. We have two years worth of um, community resource officer position covered, uh, about 17 months of a community services officer position. And this is for half an FTE. The other half is budgeted in the fire and public works budgets. Uh, that community survey that I mentioned, hazard payments to the employees, uh, some money set aside for two years, 100000 each for homeless and mental health initiatives, 75000 <laughs> for three years in a row to outdoor recreation. So we talked last night about 150000 was transferred into the Parks Improvement Plan. That's the first two years of those transfers. Money set aside for police vehicles. Uh, and then down below is the pool infrastructure. So 150000 is already transferred in to the pool improvement fund. And then the 500,000 that moved from the community center is uh, budgeted in, in fiscal year 23. So in this budget we're speaking about tonight. And then the fire rescue vehicles, those have already been authorized by council um, and expected to be paid for in fiscal year 23. And then uh, 15,000 set aside in this proposed budget for telehealth room at the library. The critical point on this, <laughs> You see some very critical purchases here. For instance, the fire vehicles, the police vehicles, um, public recreation. These are things that there's not enough tax dollar money to pay for. Um, very fortunate. Um, but at the same nation, I always say, look at the person on your right, look at the person on the left, um, because this is where this money comes from. This all comes down, you know, it all gets paid, it all comes back and trickles down. And so over the next five years, we expect, you know, trillion dollars or so um, to come into local governments. And so we aggressively go after those grant funds. Um, the public sees, you know, these nice, beautiful police cars going out. Well, the reality is, is that we had a set amount, I believe it was 225,000 in the original budget. Um, and that's enough to buy how many police cars? Two. Two. 225 would be almost four, a little bit three. Almost eight. four. And so we're getting eight. Three. So I've told the council, this is like buy one, get one free. Mm -hmm. We're digging out a hole. And that's why when staff puts it together, we take it to the governing body. Ultimately, the governing body is the fiduciary. You know, they decide, nah, you know, well, I have four police cars, put it in different. And so they're in control of that budget. So for instance, Let's say that they decide they need some money for the community center. They can always go here, they come back to staff, they ask for recommendations. We go back 
and figure out what buckets can we move things around potentially. Um, you see the community survey here. And it seems like, wow, that's a lot of money for community survey. There's two surveys. The one is we're still on the heels of the public safety fee and some of the uh, ill will that I believe that was inherited and the transparency in the trucks. One of the council goals was to address some of that and then realign the law enforcement budget with actual revenues. And so that survey is part of rebuilding the trucks and the connectivity with our law enforcement. That's in the field. Right behind that is the National Community Survey. And so another thing is that the council's goal is to actually create more engagement with the public and work to make our priorities their priorities. Well, that's a mechanism to see what our community's priorities are. And you have to be a North Bend resident to participate in those surveys. And so we used ARCO money because quite frankly, we didn't have tax dollar money to do it. So when this came in, there was a specific um, package um, with Polco, the company we're using, that we're able to get that at discount. <coughs> So that's why we're doing it in that fashion, as opposed to trying to do it on our own via Facebook, which only gets a certain segment, although large, or folks that pop in at the library or vice versa. If you've all done polls or surveys, you know they are what they are. These are statistically sound survey results, and the governing body will get presentations of results from them. And then that will then go into the strategic planning of the council that is seated in January uh, 2023, because we operate on a two-year planning cycle. So. Thank you. Just for clarification, this is for the coronavirus money. That's the spreadsheet. Correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the increase in professional services on multiple pages. So the first one was in parks. Uh, and I provided a breakdown here. So security uh, is $9,100. And then as discussed last night, $5,000 was added for tree trimming and arborist services. So this is new in this year's budget. And that's the uh, main reason for that increase. Then in the library donation fund, um, the library director has broken down what those expenses are. So um, we've got the LSTA ARPA funding for 52,000 a new contract with Coos Health and Wellness for 62,000, architectural services for library capital improvements at 40,000, and the balance is miscellaneous things um, that may need to be expended during the year. In public works professional services, these are uh, consultant costs associated with those um, planning grants we discussed last night. So consultants for the housing analysis, parks master plan, the economic opportunities analysis and the Ferry Road Park Heritage Man Her Ferry Road Park Heritage Management Plan, something like that. The majority of which is offset, as I mentioned, by grant funding, and then also budgeted here are some costs for code changes, state housing updates, and hearings officers' costs. Uh, I should have asked this in the prior slide. Uh, can we just get a two sentence overview of what the telehealth station at the library is going to be? Thank you. Hi. So many rural libraries in the Midwest have implemented telehealth programs or services at their public libraries. And it's something that I believe would be a good fit for our community. We currently have uh, students and personnel from OHSU and various other health agencies who are meeting with clients in our public conference room. And we are also using our public conference room for our community engagement specialist who is a mental health associate. And that space uh, is not well suited for those purposes. It does have a large window that looks into the rest of the library. It uh, cuts down on the amount of time that that room is available for public use for other meetings. And the library currently has a storage room that uh, was previously used to house a lot of IT equipment 
that is uh, now remotely hosted that would be ideal to convert to a telehealth space. So I've been in conversation with some of our community partners. Uh, I believe that the $15,000 that would be contributed from the city, uh, there's very likely that we've received some sort of grant match to finish out that space so that it would be a private area for people to come for uh, virtual visits with their doctors. It would be a space for people who were meeting students or other health workers uh, to use. And then also, of course, for our own community engagement specialists uh, to use with clients. I was thinking, so, it's, so it's telehealth. However, it sounds like it's, uh, it's another location for actual direct services and mental and physical health as well. That's right. That's so it, it would have uh, telehealth capabilities, but for us, it would be a multifunctional space. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> Another question here, why the increase in maintenance, repair, and grounds? Uh, as I mentioned, we consolidated some line items where it made sense. So this is one in particular. So in the parks department, um, we consolidated the maintenance, repair, grounds line item with the grounds and roadway supplies line <laughs> item. So it's really just moving money from one line item to come up to the other and, and keeping them in one spot. There was a slight increase from last year, about $1,500 due to supply costs going up. And then why the increase in OT? So when I took a look, uh, both of these pages, this is the police and fire budgets and overtime itself has actually decreased in both of these budgets. Um, the figures are shown there. What I think maybe uh, the question was around is the retirement costs went up. And as I mentioned last night, that's uh, due to how um, we calculated over time and the fact that when you pay over time, there's also an associated retirement cost with it. And previously, the formula that we used to calculate over time wasn't capturing that. So um, this new method captures the cost of retirement that we have to pay when somebody works overtime. All right, but in 21, you only had $18,000 in overtime. And in 22, I don't know what the actual is, but 23 is another 118. If you combine it with the fire over time, it's like $300,000. As compared to as compared to 21. So in the fire budget, you're looking at the 18,000 in the overtime line item, but below that there's also 63,000. So that's also overtime. This is one of those situations where we've combined the two again. And so between the fiscal year 21 and 22 budget, there was added um, an added position. Uh, restored position, I should say. So your fiscal year 21 actuals represent one position less, so you would have less overtime. Um, and then also have to take into consideration that uh, cost of living adjustments occur. And so that means those wages, overtime wages go up as well. So the 4% and the 3% are figured in overtime as well? Mm -hmm. Correct. What's the FTE on 130,000? Currently, there's 10 FTE in the fire department. Um, at, during fiscal year 21, there was nine. Does that answer your question there? We have two years, we have two and our firefighters, when they work a certain FSLA, um, they work a certain amount of hours and they automatically get uh, at that time between 10 hours and then there was 12 hours of overtime they automatically get for working their normal hours. And that's because firefighters work an extra amount of hours. And it's an, it's an agreed upon fair labor standards. And we had that what we call regular overtime, which is just a constant throughout the whole year. And that's in one particular line item. And then we had what we call emergency overtime, which that is when we had to have somebody come back in for sick leave coverage, for extra overtime for fires and, and other things. So but when they combine those two, the one, the one did look very small when you combine them together, it's a lot more flat than what it was. There's still an increase there, but it's a lot more flat than what it actually uh, 
peers. Well, isn't it cheaper to just hire another person? You're, I can answer that. <laughs> sometimes yes, sometimes no. So um, I'm going to give you a quick overview. So I've been here um, just over a year and a half. It'll be uh, the end of September, it'll be two years. And so one of the first things that I was trying to do was get my arms around over time and try to get it in line. And so one of the first things we did was restore a position in the fire department uh, because it was cheaper in the long run and because of succession planning to go ahead and restore a position that they had actually lost previously. And then you started to see their costs go up. Um, I tried to work aggressively for about six to eight months to do so in the police department, but I could never, um, I could never get my arms around um, how the overtime was accruing. Um, fast forward under new administration, um, I got very educated very fast. It was because the shifts were designed to have mandatory overtime in every law enforcement shift. Mm -hmm. So every officer that went out was guaranteed overtime. So I, as an administrator, couldn't get my arms around and work. So when we came to the council and put in some additional staffing to offset that, it had zero effect. In fact, they didn't hire that particular position. Now in the police department, you have these four distinct shifts. And so we have the coverage, we have the staffing. Um, we don't have that overtime issue, if you will. Fire department is a staffing you know, issue. When, when you work the 48 on, 72 <laughs> off, and then in a cycle, automatically within their system is what's called the did I get that wrong? No. Oh, okay. Close enough. <laughs> yeah. You don't get 72 hours? 4896. Oh, 4896. Yeah, okay. Um, so so that automatically under federal law has a certain amount of overtime. But folks have to have vacation, so you have to, to staff. If you have a fire event or something large, you have to bring in folks. So you will incur that. And that's where the two line items of the chief mentions. Now under the current finance director, it's like overtime's overtime. And so when we look at the budget, what we're trying to do is capitalize on that. Um, one of the things that we spoke about with the, uh, today, um, uh, and, and I don't have the figure, um, uh, JT, uh, maybe able to, to fill me back in, but for every dollar we pay an average employee, um, then the benefits alone, so all the benefits, pension, everything, especially if they're in one of the three unions, um, is about, for some reason, it's one point. I would say close to 30%. Yeah. yeah. One four, isn't it? Ralph's saying higher. I, I think it's higher on the calculations I've done mm -hmm. on the union folks, but uh, across the yeah, board. Yeah, it's going to be different depending on the group. Yeah. yeah. So, how much do you think it is? Well, I think 1.3. But... Okay. So, I'm going to go with our finance directors. <laughs> and, and we've done different. And, and David, for, for clarification, you're saying because, you know, you, you have like example for a police officer, it's like the salary. But then there's the the PERS package, and then there's the medical insurance or any other benefits, the vacation yeah, package. Yeah, the all-in that we yeah. call it. So, the all in. And uh, payroll taxes and all that's got to be higher than 30%. Yeah. Yeah. But those are all separate lineups. Yeah, but okay. when you ask the question of, does it make sense to go out and hire someone sometimes, as opposed yes. to, sometimes. and sometimes do that? That's the question that comes down at the management level is that that overtime actually has to meet a full-time employee plus all their benefits and it has to be consistent before you would increase an FTE. Does that make sense? Okay. And we're not there yet in the fire department. Fire department would like one more position, but we're not giving them that. 
and then the police are, are staffed at where they should be. The one more position though, it wouldn't eliminate the um, the overtime though, if it's <clears throat> by the federal law, if it's 48 hours on. It would not eliminate the FSLA overtime though. No. The automatic 10 the hours. The automatic 10 hours per 2040 cycle. Is that a federal thing or is that a that's, that's federal? federal. <coughs> okay. that's it's not exactly. a negotiated no, no, that's, that's federal. Federal. Is that <laughs> uh, chief? Is that like the typical amount uh, of shift schedule throughout firefighting, like throughout our state? Is that the typical to 48 on, 96 off? Is that typical? Yeah, there, there's a couple of variances to it, but 4896 is one, 2448 was kind of what we'll call the old school. Uh -huh. And it's came more prominent now to do the 4896. Really? And okay. yeah, and it it over the whole year it it's the same basically. There, there's a couple little variants to it, but not a lot. And one thing that we do keep in mind for our overtime that we have, what we call our emergency overtime, um, there can be so many variables to that. From, from somebody getting hurt and being off an extended period of time, <clears throat> as that person is off, or it, it, as we know, um, Chief McCullough broke his arm. That's a that's a six weeks or so that somebody's not going to be able to work if they're fired. So that six week period, we could can potentially have six weeks of straight overtime for somebody getting getting um, extra people working for that. Um, right. We could have a, you know large scale fires that adds up a lot of work. A lot of a lot of variables that can really come into play. So we do have some some built into there as well for to absorb that. Hopefully, if the situation comes up. Thanks. We got the wrong band, Gary. Take good job. I always wanted to be a fireman. <laughs> when I grow up. Sorry, is that? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think we're good. I'll be back up again. Till the next one. Uh, this question is why the jump in health insurance on page 73, which is the transient room tax fund, not the TAS fund. Um, this is because the full-time equivalents increased partially due to reallocation of positions, but mostly because we added a main street manager position. So uh, the fund went from 0.21 of an FTE to 1.15 FTE, and the cost for insurance is about 18,000 to 25,000 per employee. Uh, I'm really not sure what the question or comment was on this one, so I'd be open to um, having that question asked, but this was, I just wanted to add, specific to the Homelessness Pilot Project Fund, and this is the one that staff has um, recommended be eliminated from the budget because Coos County is actually going to be the fiscal agent of this money instead of yeah. the city of North Bend. But if there's a question there, I'd be happy to try and address it. I just wondered if affordable housing was any part of any of that uh, homeless. So the homeless is one issue. Um, affordable housing is another issue. Um, most of the efforts on the homeless is addressing um, uh, mental health issues um, and other services. The affordable housing, there's a uh, Coos County Housing Action Task Force, uh, very concise sit on that group. And so we meet once a month. And so we are working on affordable housing initiatives. In fact, staff just had a meeting earlier this week uh, with the Housing Authority. And the uh, director of the Housing Authority will actually be coming to the council making a presentation. Uh, sort of a status update, um, I believe at the first meeting in June, June 13th. Um, June 13th. And so there are a lot of initiatives going on. Um, affordable housing, as you know, isn't a localized issue. The entire nation is having right. this issue. And so, um, so, so there are, uh, the city itself, it's our renewal agency, um, is trying to address some housing. And so um, we anticipate um, in 2023, um, actually having Earth moved, um, and because nothing moves fast, um, just the environmentals alone and things that we have to go through. Um, and um, SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office, before I can even tear down a building. Um, so there's all of these governmental regulations. So when the citizen says, oh, the red tape, we have red tape too. <laughs> And so, um, 
So that's where affordable housing is, um, you know, separate sort of out of our budget because we're not a housing provider. We actually um, appoint to the housing authority and then they actually take it from there. Although any um, planning, regulatory things of that, permits, that all then comes back to us as a local agency, but we do so cooperatively. And they are working on a very large project that I suspect they'll close on um, by the end of the year. Um, Thank you. And so this one is uh, regarding the gas tax fund. So let's flip real quick. Uh, having to do with revenue. So there was a decrease from fiscal year 23 budget of $662,100 to the proposed budget for fiscal year 23 is $125,000. Um, this is more of the typical annual allotment that we get. So that's usually anywhere from about 110,000 to 127,000. The reason why fiscal year 22 was so much higher is because that's an accumulation of years of saving that money because we had some larger projects to tackle in uh, the current fiscal year, fiscal year 22. And so the example here is Virginia and Colorado paving, which was a $696,000 project. And I believe our public works director is coming to elaborate. Basically, in past years, it changed to July 1st of 2021. <clears throat> ODOT banked the funds for us and we had to apply for them um, to do larger projects. We saved up. This was a, we actually, our last application that we got in 2020 was $1,067,000, which was eight years, a little over eight years worth of accumulation which shame on us for not spending part of that, but you'll see two years worth of budget, 290 some thousand a year before and 692,000 <laughs> last year, which is actually low. I think we requested 700 and some. That was approximately eight years worth of accumulation. After FY 2021 or July 1 of 2021, excuse me, um, they've now changed their policy so we will be able to directly receive we just signed there we will have council council did approve already a new agreement uh, so we can request those funds now that we have a new agreement as the state next year on january 1 we can request those funds and put it in our own bank instead of letting them bank it for us and then have a new request that based on a project-based orientation we still have the reporting requirements but it's a a simpler process for everybody, but they're taking four more percent out of our money than they used to. So I'm not quite sure, but <laughs> but we're okay with it. So one thing, Ralph, that I think also <laughs> I want to address is um, is it Tina? Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I'm looking at that. So she's been so quiet. What street do you live on? I live on Channel. How, how how wide is channel? How long is channel? How long? Yeah, probably <laughs> 1,100 feet, I guess. It kind of angles through there. Yeah, so it's it's a third. Right. Very small. All right. That's that one that goes out and comes back in. It's like all the way to the end of Virginia. Yeah. yeah. It comes off Virginia to Cleveland, but yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how much would it cost to pay Tina Street? This year, we don't even want to talk about it, but um, asphalt prices this year are up well, about 44% over last year. And last year wasn't cheap. Um, but on a normal year, you look at resurfacing the street is a million dollars a mile, 1,100 feet. So you're just right out a quarter mile, just under a quarter mile. So $250,000 if the disabled access ramps are all good. <laughs> because if they're not, we're spending okay. 7000 per ramp to replace those because under the ADA mandates, if it doesn't meet current code, we have to replace it. If we are resurfacing, we can do, we can paint it black. That means we can spray fog coat over it, which all it does is seal the surface. That's okay. But if we overlay it or mill it out and replace it, we have to replace the ramps. Seven thousand dollars a pop. And there's four per average intersection, so that takes in more money too. 
So a quarter million for her first grade. Rough number. And how much do you get a year in STP? 125,000. But we also, our state gas tax dollars are our whole state gas fund. That's our federal monies. We typically have 100 to 150,000. Extra replacement funds out of that. So we got enough to pay them eleven hundred feet a year. So we have we have between two fifty and three hundred. Yeah. So you're getting a new road this year. So yeah, congratulations. <laughs> Here's the way so our that Thanks, is we have about conservative conservatively sixty million dollars of need just on roads, but we have a plan for that, Ron. We have a plan. We just don't have the money. You got, a you got a plan to, to get some money. Work, right. They actually know what the worst roads in H are and how old. And some of these roads are as old as I am and older. Um, but that's the, the reason I wanted, Ralph, to, is so that you can get your arms around why it's so difficult to manage this in this city. Because we have enough to do Tina's. And that's it. I don't think we have enough to do Tina's. No, we're sure. <laughs> well, she doesn't 50 have some, of uh, crosswalks or yeah. ADA stuff or, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's tough. Sweet. Thank you. I really appreciate these examples and I really appreciate the preparedness of all of the leaders in our segments of the city. I, thank you so much. Yeah, do we want to think about we have taking a break point? since we're about an hour and a half in okay. break for a few minutes? Um, shall we take shall we take a brief adjournment, say five minutes? We'll meet back here at 657. Okay. Race for that. Race. <laughs>
I'd like to call us back to order to hear the rest of the staff presentation for the fiscal year 2023 budget. Answering questions from yesterday. There we go. Next question regarding California boat ramp funding. Where is it budgeted and where does it come from? So the city receives almost $5,000 each year from the Oregon State Marine Board. This is a matching grant that we receive. Um, so any staff that works on maintaining or cleaning uh, that area tracks their time. And we typically use staff uh, time and wages as our portion of the match. Um, and then usually that $5,000 is reimbursing material costs, supplies, um, or any major improvements for the year. So this is budgeted in the general fund and out of the parks department. So parks uh, maintenance folks are the ones who maintain that. Yeah, and this is my item. And, and really it's about, I, 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 what I was just mentioning at the break, I, I think we have an opportunity to capitalize on um, visible uh, improvements that the city makes, right? And and for me, the budget message, you know, is missing this opportunity, right? So this is a, a really small item, but so many people see it. They're like, like everyone sees it when they launch a, a boat off California Street, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm, I'm just wondering if the <clears throat> council's interested in, in making you know, recommendations for adjustments on this budget message. You know, to to capitalize on things like the, you know, the fire truck purchase or or these other like like pretty remarkable, you know, uh, uh, items that are either like high, high visibility items like the pool or for me the boat ramp uh, or some of these other hidden items that it takes a little bit of explanation, you know, and then then that would you know loop address that kind of that ill will that we uh, some residents have from the from the fee you know from a couple of years ago well let the city administrator speak to the budget message because he prepares that so the opening budget message i gave you i guess you know was like an abbreviated version and so it walks you through every single fund back it's like i would have bored you and put you to sleep if i read all 17 pages um, and so what we do is we take you through every single additional, you know, fund. Um, what we try to do on the budget stories is we try to what we call thread a narrative. And so what you see on our websites, what you see on our social media sites, what you see going out to the newspaper in the center, those are our narratives where we actually throughout the entire year let folks know what we're doing for instance the boat ramp was heavily featured on sunday on a set i believe it was 12 photos um, that as of this morning has been seen by just over 12,000 people um, that sees the beauty of what north bend's about and that gets maintained also as our workers and employees are out um, we ask them take a snapshot um, for some reason, the wastewater treatment folks don't ever do that, but I guess I understand why. But um, but a lot of the departments participate in that, and then we then send that message out. So not everyone is subscribed to our e-alerts, but it's an option right off a website. We unveiled the new website, so we actually thread all these photos throughout the website. Um, and then we have uh, a new system that then also sends it out. Um, and then that also then automatically sends it to a media list. So when you see, if you ever do see the newspaper, the description's way down, I subscribe. But when you see photos, if you ever look at a photo and you see the word contributed, nine yes. heads out kind of came from the city. The city. Um, and uh, same thing with uh, Facebook. Um, folks are like ah, facebook's interesting okay well i will tell you that a post on um, our facebook page um, some of these um, uh, in a city of ten thousand, 
uh, we have gotten as many as 98,000 views on uh, a post. So we thread this and we promote it. The budget message itself, unfortunately, as much as I would say, um, we actually have analytics on our website. Same thing on our uh, video that's being recorded. And we can tell you how many people actually looked at that. The other mechanisms, we can actually show you analytics and usage. And so one of the things in the budget you saw, because um, I brought it to council, is we're eliminating the public access TV. It's a duplicated cost because we already make it available out. It's out there on demand and it integrates now with our system. So all of that is what we call basically a seven by seven marketing plan. And so that's where the threaded budget message for staff, staff will get frustrated. And I, I we, we deal with it internally. For instance, the $350,000 ice skating ring that only costs 75,000, you know, and folks think despite the fact that we put it out multiple times that it's paid by the transient lodging tax, doesn't matter. Folks are going to digest the information that they will want. So one of the reasons that we have threaded some additional information in you is because when questions come up, as, as one of the council members says, I mean, Councilman Richardson, you know, if, if, if he goes beyond a week without calling me, I think he goes through withdrawals <laughs> because he wants to be able to answer people's questions when they have. And so that's why you've seen me motion staff up. They'd much rather be with their family and friends, you know, but luckily, you know, they all love JT. So we're hanging out with her and supporting her. Um, but it's because you all are the voices out of the community. You're another extension of creating the message. JT is working on um, two initiatives that were approved by the budget, uh, by, by the council, um, but we lacked the staff resources because she was busy catching up from things that weren't done prior to her arrival. And then we had a staff member um, vacancy um, for a considerable amount of time. So for instance, she has this budget book software that is actually going to raise the budget in next year to a whole nother level. And so if, you, if you've seen, there's been a reference to, uh, I believe it's called budget book or- Digital yeah. budget book. Yeah. And so that's all going to come to play. And so every year, um, this is my second budget uh, with this governing body and, and committee. And so each year, JT, I'm sorry, Carl JT, because I have two, you know, Mayor, but Jessica, I'm Jessica. And so I call her JT, so I apologize. But um, for y'all, apparently she knows I call her JT. And so she's been able to raise the bar, you know, and so this is year two and it's gotten even better. And next year, you know, she'll hit it out of the park because she'll have this new tool resource. So I hear you, I appreciate it, but at the same point, I need folks in the community, like when they see something on social media that they know that's not true or they question, call us. We'll give you the answer and then go back and address it, please. Because we combat disinformation and misinformation. Um, I wish I had the money to create the Department of Corrections because I would address the rumors all day long. And, and, and they are out there. So point well taken. I got asked why why we put the, the school bond measure together. And I, yeah. and I you know, said no, you know. Yeah, why did you do that? <laughs> Can I just make sure, because just in case somebody was tuning in right when you made that comment, we did not pay $350,000 for an ice skating <laughs> ring and $75,000 tourism money. $75,000 tourism money. Let's keep repeating yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, we just reposted that across social media and the website today yeah. um, just to reiterate to folks. I think Anthony was giving us a compliment, though, by the way, right, about some of the good things that we we're doing. Is that I'm, what it I'm trying to, yeah. But, <laughs> but, but also, you know, I, I am in the words on paper business, and people don't like words on paper, right? And, and if it's words on a screen, it's not much better, right? So, you know, nobody cares about schools. 
I, I ask people what happens in the seventh grade, almost nobody can tell me, except parents, maybe. <clears throat> but because of the Heritage Foundation and the money they spent in Fox News programming, a bunch of people want to ask me about critical race theory. They don't know what it is or how, you know, but what I'm saying is I, I wish the council would consider significant changes in resources to how this message or some message of the city's accomplishments is put together. I think we have to consider the audience and adjust, and it, it maybe the budget message is not the appropriate place for it. Um, we did a city newsletter Something and maybe that would be something that we can expand on to get that information to people. Well, I mean, step back for a second. Let's just ask a question first. Then I'm going to take a quick poll. If you watched or attended the State of the City address, raise your hand. <laughs> can you raise it if you gave it? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, <laughs> if you're in the Rotary, for instance, um, and you heard the Renaissance uh, presentation, raise your hand. So, so for instance, we know because of the marketing seven by seven, you know, we utilize best practices of like all the governments. We're all in professional organizations. That, that, that's why we're using this uh, budget book technology to take it to the next. We hear loud and clear. It's also the reason that we're proactively now going to the public and surveying, trying to engage the, the engagement is because Everything that you just said, state of the city, you know, Renaissance, um, all of the, you know, the, the chamber, um, LAT, um, legislative um, action uh, uh, team, all these things that we go out, out and, and, and make these presentations and interact. Um, in fact, we, we just obtained um, Doodly software, and we're trying to hold another approach now to try to get some of the, the, the messaging across and simplify in small little chunks. Because if you look at the overall success, what folks learn when they ask those questions, um, you know, at the coffees and things that we do, it's like, oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And that's fascinating because it's like, where are you getting your information? Where are you interacting? Where are you connecting? I know, for instance, the mayor takes the, the media that we send out, she, she hits it like, you know, I don't know how many different places um, and just mess about it. So we know based on numbers what we're hitting, but it doesn't mean that you're digesting and taking it away. And we do video, we do printed, we do presentations. We do persons. I've gotten up and sang and danced, in fact. Uh, <laughs> you do what you can to get their attention. Um, and so, and, and the staff does the same thing. And we still have folks that will say, you know, you got 375,000 ice skating rink. When in fact, we know it's not the case. We, we have folks that, Want to know why we're focusing on downtown businesses? And they'll say, how come you're not focusing on others? Or they'll say, hey, how come you're, you know, doing food trucks, but but but, but there's brick and mortar stores? And so when they start to see what we're doing collectively, um, in fact, and, and I'll end it with this. I'll just pick on this gentleman since he's been so quiet. Paul. <clears throat> um, Paul's in the Parks Department, okay? When you go to the budget book, and you flip to the page and you start to see everything that the parks department does, the public's like, oh, well, I just like took care of a couple of parks. You know, all these different departments fulfill so many different responsibilities and they do so with limited resources. And, and so, uh, you know, the okay. newsletters and everything, I, 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 we're open to suggestions of how to better get the message out. But you all are our message piece. Yeah, I was just thinking that to myself. I mean, part of the interest for me getting on this committee was to learn more. Uh, it also feels very uh, important to share with the people mm -hmm. in my circle who then share. And it also feels important to me um, to address in a non-confrontational way 
uh, things that are incorrect that are floating around out there. It's like, you know, right. hey, I heard you say this. Just so you know, you can ask the mayor's office yourself. You can ask the city administrator yourself. But this is what I learned about this. So I feel like it's really this. This is a piece of us that we're we're here for these meetings. But we're really here for after the meetings mm -hmm. to to enlarge the circle. Um, that's that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, Believe absolutely. Me. I mean, I, that, that I think it's our responsibility, hopeful. whether we're on the council <laughs> or not, is just share what we're yeah. learning. It's like how many people are in the parks department? Does everybody know how many people mm -hmm. are in the parks department? Does anybody know? Four. Yeah. How many? Uh, Ralph knows. <laughs> Three. Three. <laughs> Three people in the entire city of North Bend keep the parks and the city hall and what else the community, community center. center i mean it just goes on and on and on for these people yeah, well and, and while we're he's just one one portion it's crazy how much they do while we're on this um and i've this is the third cycle that i've witnessed with many of the same people and many newcomers mm -hmm. um and i'm a transplant here myself i have a almost 20 years in the boston software industry uh, amongst the luminaries of the business world, right? These are the finest, these are the MITs and the Harvards and you know the people that get lots of opportunity. They are not as well prepared as any of our leaders in this room are, none of them. Not the billionaire I work for, not the multitude of millionaires I work for. We really appreciate your service, gentle people. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Maybe they'd lend us some money. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be a better bet. We would be a better bet, people. We would be a better bet. Yeah. We appreciate everything. <clears throat> All right. This one is regarding the um, split that I talked about of IT costs and professional services um, that are in the general fund, but that some of the other funds and departments also benefit from. So this year's approach was to split those costs out where it was appropriate um, to some of these other funds. So the pool, gas tax, wastewater, stormwater, building program, and transient room tax. Um, libraries excluded uh, due to a contract between the library district and the city. Um, but so some of the examples would be our HR software and our budgeting software. Those aren't just used by the departments within the general fund. It's we also budget for wastewater and stormwater and all of those other funds I mentioned. So it's appropriate um, to split those costs to the other funds and then it alleviates some pressure on the general fund, which is part of what we're trying to gear towards is to start right sizing that general fund so that if in a few years we have to bring the pool back into the general fund, we have a better idea of what our actual costs in the general fund are and we're prepared for that. So um, because this particular question asked to hear from the managers of those budgets that were impacted, I would ask Ralph if he would like to come up and talk. Well, briefly, um, even though Jessica's gouging me, <laughs> I'm teasing her. <laughs> We work together as a team to distribute uh, distribute these costs amongst the departments as public works, for example, is 15 employees total or 14 right now, 15 proposed, second biggest department in the city. And as I proudly stated before, I manage eight budgets, five of which have personnel services, the other ones. And if you look at the public works budgets, for an example, you'll see unlike the stuff in the general fund, we're typically not more than 40% personnel services and the rest of it's maintenance or capital improvement dollars um, because we're maintaining facilities the city owns more so than necessarily being manpower heavy. Um, we don't have to be on duty 24 hours a day or 48 hours or in a row. But as I tease her about gouging me, no, most of this week, pre look at these and say uh, every year we reevaluate because for example you'll see more monies this year attributed to urban renewal from a lot of staff because we're making some changes in the urban renewal sector and looking at uh, both in the planning end and, and spending some more money there 
but we reallocate annually um, and we're trying to do more true cost accounting, if that makes sense. Like in any business, um, and I own a business still, even though I work here, I won't say where, but I, you know, you still have to allocate your resources so that your cost is fair for what you're dealing with. And that's pretty much what this is. Thank you. Um, okay, how does the accounting technician make more than the finance director? <laughs> In this particular question, um, it's, it's because of the FTE. So that one particular accounting technician line item actually, uh, when we were talking about the general fund is 1.755 FTE. So uh, we have two full-time accounting technicians and this year's budget proposes uh, another 0.6 FTE accounting technician and those are those costs are split across multiple funds again because those positions work not just in the general fund they work for some of those other departments as well so Jessica, that's the reason why that particular line item oh, i'm just wondering if somebody needs to have an explanation of what fte is maybe they don't understand full, it sure full-time equivalent so one fte is a full-time position um, 0.6 of an fte would be a 24 hour a week position and FTEs are a measurement that's required so that you can share resources when one department doesn't have enough room for, say, an accounting technician divided amongst many. And this is so that you can allocate appropriately. Yes, correct. Thank so you. It's quite in the service of shared resources <clears throat> and economy of scale. <laughs> All right. Um, and then looking at the 5% cost of living adjustment, this one, uh, please speak more to the 5% wage increase to unrepresented positions. So I did want to clarify that unrepresented isn't just the management positions. This is also our non-management position. So it could be like library positions, wastewater department, uh, parks maintenance workers. It's just anybody who's not covered by a union currently. Um, and so historically, these unrepresented positions uh, haven't received, they've received the lower end of any cost of living adjustments we've done each year. And so this increase essentially brings um, those particular positions uh, up to kind of the same overall increase as, as most of those other union positions have seen. So um, the middle section here looks at a seven year average of those adjustments, and you can see Unrepresented, it's a 2.29% average, which is equal to uh, streets and then less than the police. However, it is higher currently than fire. Um, I also just wanted to notate here that our unrepresented employees, um, they also pay 10% of insurance costs where those union members uh, contribute 5%. And then there's also um, the fact that every three years when we bargain those contracts, um, we do have an analysis done on each of the positions to ensure that they are at an appropriate uh, comparable level to other entities of the same size. Um, and then we'll just add in that there's you know, additional incentives with um, those unions like longevity, equipment allowance, and, and differences in leave accruals. So it's not... not uh, just the the cola that's um you know we have to take into consideration so i hope that addresses that question um how many city employees are there across all the departments i think it's right around 250 oh i can never remember between part-timers i just gave it to you the day. Full -time 63, just roughly 63 63 and um how many are unrepresented 10 you know, no. just a ballpark. Yeah, probably about half. About so half. half. Okay. Thank you. And so, um, and, and so, as yeah. I uh, said in the past, when I did the uh, budget budget messaging, um, so the streets department, which has three, three yeah, three. Right. Proposed to have four. Yeah, first box. But, but so the streets department has three. The fire department has eight. Ten. Eight, eight union. Eight, eight, eight in the union. Yeah. And then the police department has 13, 15, 16, 16. Yeah. All right, so 16 in their proposal. So when you put those together, you know, about half, all the rest are unrepresented. 
And so um, when I look at the budget, um, I'm looking at holistically everything. Um, I, I, I know the bottom line on all three budgets, um, all three unions. Um, and so one thing that um, I work with our finance director on is what we call the all in. So when we go to our governing body uh, for each, they actually see the holistic picture now. The public doesn't because unless you pulled out the contract and everything, you're not going to see what I consider the plus plus pluses. For instance, the uh, average police officer, yes, last year um, was north of 7% all net. Okay. The public doesn't see all of that because there's contractual things in there. That's why they're in a union. That's why they, they bargain for those things. Um, and so I'm sort of the if you want to call it a union representative, I'm a representative for the um, uh, the uh, the non-representative. <laughs> and so when I'm looking at everything, I know that um, when I look at some of these department heads and the employees within them, um, we have tried to aggressively work through some things. So for instance, you heard in the library where each employee pretty much has done a step increase and we've addressed some of those salaries but they haven't had compensation studies because the union gets those automatically. So for the first time, and no one can really remember last time they've done a compensation study for an unrepresented, um, we're going to get that done. And the importance of that is, is we're starting to go through succession planning. We're starting, we've had more recruitments um, this year than staff can recall. Um, and so that's that yodeling. And so we have to get ahead of that. And so that's why we're, we're doing what we're doing, but you see where it matches out. Um, yes, I'm sure the fire department will look and say 1.86, but I also know that if, if we go toe to toe, they'll sit down and say, if they want to, yeah, but in our contract, we have X, Y, Z, and this, and A, B, C, and et cetera. And so it's comparable. That's just the COLA portion. Um, uh, for instance, the library doesn't have the same, you know, uh, vacation benefits um, as say the fire department or police. Um, uh, uh, the parks department doesn't have, you know, longevity for instance, like the, the, the police department. So there's those other things. Those that are in, in union, you know, shops um, understand that. Um, it's a little harder for the public to grasp because they're just simply looking at a cola um, in what otherwise is a uh, tough market. But we know what's behind the curtain and we know that it's very equitable um, to start to pull some of our other employees that have basically been neglected to get them a little where they need to be. Well, I think you need that for uh, employer retention as well because if you're not going to be competitive with your pay and benefit package, then they're going to go elsewhere and find work. Well, right. <clears throat> we work hard to keep morale mm -hmm. high here, and we work very hard to keep our employees happy and challenged. And so, this is some of the things. Uh, again, information, you know, and and um, I, I tell everyone, sign up. Go to our website, sign up. At least get that dispatch because we recently did. It was last month we did the engagement survey um, with with the staff, I think. Um, so so we put that data out, um, and and that will be done twice twice a year. Um, all of the department heads, myself, we just did three sixty evaluations, and so we know what you know. They know what I think. They know what their 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 department heads. They know what their direct reports think. I know what my council thinks. Does everybody so know what a 360 review is? Because uh, that is an incredibly uh, innovative and collaborative way to, to get information to the leaders, whereas typically organizations, particularly businesses, have one flow of information, which is down. A 360 allows the employees to have a response to their leaders. Um, so good going. That's that's excellent and rare. Yeah, our company actually has a servant leadership survey, so mm -hmm. we're judged mm -hmm. by our mm -hmm. employees. It, so in the end game, it's always better 
it's always better. But when leaders are dedicated to their own view of the world, it doesn't suit them. So, but the government is responsible for all of us, not just a few of us. <laughs> Thank you. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. All right. There's nothing more on that. We'll move on. Um, last three slides are related to PERS. There was a lot of questions about PERS, so I'll do my best to um, address what it is, how we pay it, where it's paid from, and what uh, the term pay down means when talking about uh, that PERS reserve money. So first of all, PERS stands for the Public Employees Retirement System. Um, all City of North Bend employees, with the exception of three in our streets department, they're in a different um, retirement program, but all of our other city employees are in the PERS retirement program. The program has three tiers or yeah, four tiers really based on higher date and or classification. So the first grouping is tier one, tier two. Then we have the OPSERP uh, general group and the OPSERP police and fire group. So. Below that, you can see the contribution rates that the city makes based on what um, category each employee is in. So I think the majority of folks are in the OPSERP category, so the police and fire and the general, uh, but we do still have some tier one, tier two folks. And so these rates are based on wages. Um, so we contribute 24.91% of an employee's um, wages each pay cycle uh, to this PERS plan, if they're tier one, tier two, and then so on and so forth. Um, in addition to these contribution rates, uh, the city also picks up the 6% IAP, which is stands for the individual account plan. And so as far as we're responding to the question about what does the employee pay, as, as far as PERS goes, the employee currently does not pay anything. Uh, these costs are budgeted in the retirement line items of each department or fund under personnel services. So we kind of talked about that earlier when we talked about fire and police over time. There's a retirement line item and it's in the personnel category. In addition to that, uh, there's about 450,000 currently. So in fiscal year 22 in the city's PERS reserve fund uh, that is set aside to be able to pay down the city's unfunded liability. And the fiscal year 23 budget proposes transferring in about $42,000 more so that there'll be close to half a million dollars for this purpose. When we talk about paying down the PERS liability, this is referring to the unfunded actuarial liability uh, referred to as the UAL. And basically what that means is that the city owes more in benefits to its members of this plan. So it could be the current uh, actively working members and also some of our retirees. Um, so we, we owe more benefits to those folks than we have funds available. So that creates a liability. There's this gap between what we need and what we have. The UAL is how much money a PERS fund would be uh, short if all benefits for members past and present had to be paid today. Paying down is the idea of closing that gap between what is owed and what is funded. So the more funds we contribute to the city's PERS plan, the more assets we have, and that narrows that gap. Um, and the two options that I talked about last night when we talked about the PERS reserve fund, one was a side account. Um, and so in this instance, the city could make a contribution. It could be that half a million dollars plus what the library is set aside, plus what wastewater is set aside, plus what the building program has set aside for this purpose. We would pay that to a per side account and it would be held in a special account and then invested. Mm -hmm. So the contribution then increases our assets and pays down that pension obligation or the liability. And then our future contribution rates, so that 24%, 18%, 20% I talked about, our future contribution rates would be reduced because we've funded more uh, than our required annual contribution. The second option is similar, um, but in this particular instance, PERS, uh, and so that's called the Employer's Incentive Fund, and PERS makes um, a match or has in the past. And so I think the last time it occurred was about two years ago, um, and the match was 25% from PERS. So if the city contributed 100,000, PERS would match it with 25,000. So if I'm understanding this correctly, the 
a fundamental difference between a side account and the employer's incentive fund is that the employer's incentive fund becomes funds that we are in charge of investing or doing something with, whereas the side account is still within PERS investment strategy. Yeah, they would, what they would both go to PERS. The, the biggest difference is that PERS matches in one instance, but not the other. So one is just invested and then PERS uh, makes a matching amount in this other one. But uh, right now, the employer's incentive fund, they're not opening it up. So it's, it's more competitive. So it sounds more enticing, um, but it's also more competitive and they're not sure you know, what the, the future of that program is. So that's one of the goals in this next year is we've got the money set aside now. What's our best option? What's going to be available to start analyzing the difference in the two? But these are kind of the basic differences. So, okay, so correct me if I'm wrong. So it still seems like, so why, why would PERS be interested in doing anything, right? Why would, why would the PERS system? It would be only if, if it took away from future liabilities for that segment as a whole. So is that correct? That this EIF is, becomes separate from the PERS system for future? Um, I guess I don't have that much knowledge then of of okay. how they're handling it. So I, I honestly can't answer that at this point. And so that's why it's like, these are two options we have, how we're going to use that money. We don't know yet. And so that'll be part of the process is okay. learning more about both. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> that's the last slide that I have, unless anybody else has questions on the first. Yes. I was just wondering um, why it is that we uh, subscribe to the Land Council of Government. Um, maybe David could answer that. I wasn't sure. I saw that under the, it's the new um, council fund. And I'm, I'm just wondering, because I wasn't aware really that we ever did anything with the Lane County Council of Government. Yeah, I know we've made the, the, um, contribution in years past. So that's something we've continued to carry over, but I'm, I'm not sure entirely what comes well, out. Our local that. council government, as you know, or, or may not know for the benefit of the others, um, was really dissolved. And so they're a regional service um, for local governments for various services. Um, for instance, you can contract with them for grant writing. You can contract <laughs> them for, uh, say, um, uh, ju judicial services um, uh, for appeals um, of that nature. Uh, planning, grant writing, um, and they also do um, various studies. Um, so um, they are an entity that um, the local governments um, here uh, utilize for a number of purposes. They also, of course, publish um, uh, uh, CPI and other data as well in concert with uh, PSU and uh, other agencies. Um, so they're basically our local service district that we can um, task um, or engage with um, on a myriad of projects or services. So it sounds like the lane portion is just in the name. This is a service provider for some of the unique municipal information sources, information and service projecty things. So lane is just where they have to be located in this moment. Is gone. So, Got it. so, so, so the region now uses, you know, Lane, which services a much larger area. Well, and thank them. <laughs> thank you. Well, they, they, have, they have staff who have the, you know, planners and economists and the grant writers, that kind of thing, for small little towns that don't have permanent staff mm -hmm. on hand. Have we used their services in the last five years, say? Uh, in fact, um, they just literally came up within the last two weeks of discussions um, because in uh, we're, we're required to have uh, an appeals board. And so we have been talking with the county and uh, Coos Bay as to how to address some of this. Um, uh, it was discovered in state law. And so um, uh, the ju judicial part um, can actually be a contracted uh, position through appeals through wow. the Lane Council of Government. And so uh, we went over and visited our sister city um, to figure out um, uh, what they were planning and how we could work together on some of those efforts and then met with the county. Uh, so we do uh, have them available to us. Um, uh, they also do compensation studies. Um, so uh, uh, 
we but we haven't engaged directly right now. I believe we're using this at PSU um, for ours um, at the recommendation of our labor attorney. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Jessica. Yes. Um how much is the city's unfunded liability? Ooh, I was gonna look that up before the meeting too, and I forgot. It's it's in our audit, and honestly, I haven't poked around to look and see what the actual number is. So oh, is it a million dollars? Is it 20? I know that our unfunded liability one? for our old retirement plan is 1.2 million because that one I have had to deal with recently. I, I don't know off the top of my head for purse. And going back a couple of slides, did I understand that the city contributes 25% of employees' wages toward PERS? It depends on what tier, tier they're in. Tier so one. tier one, tier two, it's 24. I think police and fire is around 20 and um, all, all general are 18%. Right, 18. Yeah, so there we go. And then plus 6% to an individual account plan. Correct. Do y'all have any openings? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's an interesting thing. So it's state mandated. One of the questions I asked was negotiated here is whether or not I could opt out of that and just do you know 457. In this state, I cannot opt out. Um, it was something I asked. It is mandated by law. Um, and then so uh, another thing that that was addressed when I first got here that was being floated with the uh, various unions, um, they were initially floated with the police union, was um, whether or not uh, the unions would be open to looking at a different approach where they then could pay that 6%. And so um, I don't need to tell you where that went. Um, and so therefore, uh, uh, it was a management decision of, well, if the unions aren't going to go for it, are we then going to just disenfranchise and say, let's just have our unrepresented um, buy into that? Um, we knew what that would cause um, here locally. And so until we're at a point where you don't have a choice, that's you know what we're we're doing. Um, the governing body is aware that 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 you know that's the portion and we pick it up and it's been the way. But also then if you look at our employee salaries. <laughs> So yes, jobs open. Yes, there are jobs opening. Please apply. I will do a friendly wager. I'm not a gambling man, not allowed to. I do a friendly wager of the salaries here, they're happy employees versus um, private sector. Because I just had that conversation this morning um, with an employee who I know what the gap is, public versus private. So the benefits here overall keeps the employee happy and he likes the management and the staff and working in the city and that's what's important. So you, you, you find special folks that, you know, uh, here's a finance director, you know, I, I don't, I'm, I'm I'm moving, I'm, I'm not trying to embarrass her, but I know on a recent week, she put in 100 hours and she's an exempt employee with zero overtime. Show me someone in the private sector that will do that just for the benefit. <laughs> yeah. Besides the business <laughs> owner. <laughs> Besides the business yeah. owner. Yeah. Gentle yeah. people. Yeah. But, but I mean, that's the dedication that you get out of the staff. Um, and so if you take her hours versus what she pays, you know, they're probably making more at a fast food restaurant per hour. If you look at it in that perspective, I'm just being frank about it. You have to look at it all in. Exactly. Sure. All in is important. And that's, that's what's critical. If you start here under a personnel manual, so Robin, it's like, oh, that's good. Except you'd be coming in, so you start as a new employee. So you start with mm -hmm. how much vacation would Ron start at? 11.34 hours per month. Per month, yeah. What well, do you mean you guys get vacation? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I, I understand. I'm just trying to figure out a way where I can keep my job and still get into PERS. <laughs> <laughs> There's too late, you know, and, and, and that's why, you know, 
it's it's you know I'm not saying that you know I mean we pay a a, a, a good wage, but you know most of these folks can make a whole lot more in the private sector. They know it, but they know that they have you know good solid jobs here. They know they have a future. You know, I mean, how many of your friends don't have pensions or even know what they're doing in their future? Mm -hmm. You know, some folks here are are, are second career. Um, you know, um, some have come out of retirement. Yeah. You know, and and we're just very grateful because you know it it, it takes a lot. And some of you are in public service, and you know exactly what I'm talking about because the public beats up on you on a regular basis. So, Ron, come on board. We, we, we love good, solid, hard working, but it's not for everybody. And we know that. In the spirit of time, it's a quarter to eight. So perhaps that was we the can last move on. slide. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for that. I do not regret hearing any of that information. And uh, thank you. I think it's back to Welcome that's it. Ah, are we complete? Is the presentation complete? Yes, okay. correct. Uh, okay, so um, what we need is a motion to conclude discussion. Can, does anyone have any additional questions for any moment in this? Give people a full 30 seconds to consider. I, I do have, it's, it's quick, it's quick, I promise. Uh, what's the plan when we get the ice skating rink received and stored and put it up? What department is that going to fall under? Oh, that's a good question. And maybe I missed it, but I, that's, that's a quick question, I hope. Yeah, so, um, so we are evolving our parks department to eventually a parks and rec department. Hmm. Um, they'll be responsible for um, storing, um, and then they'll also work to put it up. The actual um, management of that will come under our Main Street program. Um, so that's where um, all of that management will come. Mm -hmm. And so that you're all aware, um, the Main Street program, uh, the council will appoint a Main Street board. So the manager will start, the board members then will get in place. The board members will then work on a strategic plan for the Main Street program. And then that will get adopted um, and put into play. And so um, there's a reason why, again, uh, there's money in there because if we utilize resources from a different department, they don't come free. They come with an allocation, if you will. So. Mm -hmm. uh, questions, going once, going twice, <laughs> three times, okay. Um, now is the time for committee deliberation and decision. Does any member of the committee wish to make a motion? The part of this is the part of the process will require a motion, a second, a discussion, hopefully briefly, and then a majority vote to carry the decision. A recommended motion was handed out to each of our committee members. It's a half sheet of paper that starts with staff recommended motion. I move to approve the budget as amendment, amended the amount of $39,388,100 and for the tax rate of 6.1831 per 1,000 of assessed value for the general property tax and 0 0.56 per 1,000 of assessed value of the local option. Second. Seconded. Motion carried. All in favor. Aye. We have discussion. Discussion. Ask any discussion on this. No discussion. Going once. No twice. Okay. So all right. So we had a first and a second. We have no a first discussion. and a second. No. Discussion is included. Do we have a motion to so now vote? We can go to a vote. Can we go to a vote right now? Yes. Okay. Let's vote. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 Any in. Uh, a boot. No. <laughs> Do you want her city recorder to read what we're all in favor for? Or was that? Oh, yes. Should I? Okay. Um, record. 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 Okay. And what about folks online? So, uh, any nays? Okay. Sorry to create chaos. So, we're going to vote right now for approving the uh, the budget at 39388100 and the two tax rates. Um, $6.1831 per 1,000 
for the assessed value and the 56 cents per 1,000 for the local option levy. This is what we are approving as we, he carries, no nays. I'm really sorry, I'm not doing good with this. Yep. Okay, motion carries. <laughs> there we go. We are going to adjourn this portion of the meeting and meet back in five minutes for the urban renewal. Is there any, is there anybody that can be dismissed? Is this just for any, any this is or anything? Can they leave? I mean, can the staff leave? That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, have, have thank you. Have Jen and the senator. Well, although they're on the edge of the seat. Oh, okay. So anyone who doesn't have to be here, thank you for your service. We meet back at 8.04, according to this clock. Okay, so we have, and this URA step is a little short here. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a 7.54. Okay. <laughs>
Who is this person? Orders, I don't know who this person is. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking at. All right, John. You got the gavel. Okay. Uh, we want. Are we just going to. So, do you have, have your other instructions? I do. Sheet? I do. Yes. Um, okay. So, Ron, last chance. You can come late if you want. Okay. Um, I know. I'm just, it's just for the peanut gallery, sir. Um, okay. I would like to call to order the meeting for the North Bend Urban Renewal Agency, the Agency Budget Committee. Um, we, at this point, need to seek a nomination, have acceptance of that nomination, a motion, a second, and a discussion, and a vote for presiding officer and secretary for this budget. Do we have any volunteers or nominations? I make a motion that we have the presiding officer remain uh, Ms. Jones um, and the uh, uh, secretary, um, Ron Cooch, if that's if we're able to do that. Uh, right. That was we just came out of the budget meeting. So I would just continue that process. Right. OK, right. all in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Discussion, then both. Discussion. Oh, OK, so we're done with the discussion, shall we? <laughs> Any discussion? Okay. There's no discussion. No discussion. No discussion. Okay, a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? Okay, motion carries. Uh, I appreciate your confidence. Although I don't necessarily live up to it. Um, okay. So, does anyone have any corrections to the min the minutes of the uh, June 2021, June 3rd, 2021 meeting? Madam Officer, I don't have any um, corrections, but I do want to take a moment and recognize that um, we have a member of the um, Budget Committee and URA Committee last year, Ruth Wiley, who's passed away. And just, just take a moment to say what an incredible person she was. Um, and many people knew that her son had passed away um, serving our country, and she was always an advocate for um, veterans rights and um, was just a really lovely lady and she supported that she was a North Bender if you ever saw one and so um, I think it's just appropriate right now to say we appreciated her service and we're so thankful that she contributed to the city and um, she um, I think she'd be really proud of the way that we're doing a great job tonight. <laughs> Let's take a two seconds for Ruth Wiley. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Ron, you've been um, elected as secretary for this meeting as well. You will be uh, approving the minutes okay. as recorded by our lady city recorder. Happy to do it. That's what okay, I Okay, so we need a motion to approve the minutes. Move to approve the minutes of June 3rd, 2021. A second? Second. Uh, is there any discussion? Then let's vote. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed say nay? Motion carries. Um, let's have the finance director walk us through the 2020 the fiscal year 23 budget. It's going to be North Bend Urban Renewal Agency. Item four, actually. Item four. Uh, oh, presentation of the budget message for this particular um, budget from David Miller Iron. Did I say your name right? No, Iron. No, Iron. Uh, the executive director of this particular agency, which is common in cities for the city administrator to also be the um, executive director of this kind of fund, which every city has, mm -hmm. just as an FYI. So, thank you. Uh, before you, you have the fiscal year 2022 23 budget message. The North Bend Urban Renewal Agency is a separate, distinct public or corporation in Oregon. The URA was formed to redevelop, underutilized, and blighted areas in portions of North Bend, while a separate, distinct agency was created according to Oregon statute. The governing board consists of the same group of people as the North Bend City Council. This is common among URAs throughout Oregon. The agency and its activities are funded by tax increment financing. It has its own budget as a separate entity and independent public budget hearings are held. For the proposed fiscal year 2023 budget, total resources budgeted for fiscal year 2022 through 2023 total 
three million seven hundred ninety thousand. This is an increase of twenty one point nine percent over the preceding year. The growth is primarily due to a higher beginning working capital due to increased tax revenue. The revenue includes working capital, interest earnings, tax revenues, and prior tax revenues. It is anticipated that the URA will receive 850,000 in tax revenues in fiscal year 2022-23, 26,000 of which is prior year taxes and 14,000 in interest earnings. Nice. As of July 1st, 2022, the budget projects working capital will be 2,900,000, be which is a 23.4% increase over fiscal year 2021-2022. The growth is not a result of significant increase in revenues. Instead, specific in-progress projects have yet to incur substantial expenditures, including the library restoration and county annex demolition. The capital outlay priorities as proposed by staff are as follows. The library restoration at 500,000 in 2020, the City of North Bend Public Library completed an initial architectural and engineering assessment on the existing facility located at 1800 Sherman Avenue in the URA district. This assessment and the final report demonstrated a significant need for renovation at the facility. In April 2021, the URA issued a call for statements of qualifications from firms with substantial architectural, engineering, and construction management experience on similar public works of improvement to provide such services to the agency for the renovation of the library. The project includes refurbishing the existing portion of the library. We are assigning community development at 740,000. That's going to give us latitude uh, throughout the year as directed by the board for projects brought to them by staff. The Visitor Information Center is budgeted at 300,000. The URA has been unsuccessful thus far in acquiring the desired property for the future Visitor Information Center on Sherman Avenue in downtown North Bend, but continues to acquire said property. Existing VIC has exceeded its useful lifespan and the cost of repair, the tangible asset now exceeds the building's fair market value. Mm -hmm. So we continue to explore alternative solutions that will meet our tourism needs. Grant programs are requested to be budgeted at 150,000. The URA offers two grant programs, the Facade Improvement Grant and the Redevelopment Assistant <laughs> Grant Program. The first program collaboratively works with the property owners to improve the appearance of businesses through facade rehabilitation and restoration that emphasizes the uniqueness and historical value. The other program encourages the redevelopment or renovation of underutilized properties within the North Bend urban renewal area and generally our interior uh, renovations. Mm -hmm. Property acquisition is 600,000. These funds are set aside to acquire real property for short-term development for adopted plans, including the North Bend Urban Renewal Plan, North Bend Downtown Waterfront Master Plan, and the North Bend Comprehensive Plan, et cetera. And then we have a line item at 1795 McPherson property, that is the former county annex. In August, 2021, the URA purchased the shuttered Coos County Courthouse Annex in two large adjacent lots for 125,000. The annex sits on 1.33 acres next to the North Bend City Hall at Virginia McPherson. The former Kaiser Memorial Building in two building lots, 0.33 acres at 2040 Union and 0.23 acres at 885 Virginia Avenue were fully appraised and purchased far less than their appraised value. Due to the age and prior use of the building, extensive environmental and hazardous materials testing was completed during the URA's due diligence period. The URA is participating in Oregon's Brownfield program for 60,000 of reimbursement of remediation of environmental activities associated with the property, including asbestos, lead paint, and two fuel tanks that need to be remediated and closed per state rules. Before the salvage and demolition permit can be issued for the 54,000 square foot former Kaiser Memorial Hospital building, the Oregon State Historic Preservation Office has requested the URA to conduct some form of approved project mitigation given the significance of the structure in the history of North Bend. 
For personnel services, the URA utilizes the City of North Bend staff for its operations and maintenance needs. After reevaluating city staff positions that work on behalf of the agency, revised salary allocations were set. The proposed budget includes full time equivalent allocations in the appendix of the document. The budget includes proportional allocations for an employee responsible for URA, visitor information, and Main Street activities within the district. In the material and services area, included in the budget is 33,000 for professional services, and that includes legal services of 5,000, audit services of 5,000, Oregon Government Ethics Commission required payment of $1,000, South Coast Development Council, 10,000, League of Oregon Cities, $500, Advertising and Marketing at $1,500, Consulting Services, Grant Writing, 5,000, Miscellaneous at 5,000. This proposed budget is respectfully submitted. And I am David Miller, your executive director. Yeah. Um, let's open it up for some questions. Actually, I'll do a quick presentation. Okay. <laughs> uh, which is really just going to mimic what uh, the executive director just said. But in the fiscal year 23 budget, resources are anticipated to increase by approximately 700000 This is a higher beginning working capital, which is the prior year's carryover. And property taxes are estimated to increase by about 70000 In personnel services, the FTE count increased, the full-time uh, equivalent count from 0.35 to 0.54. Most of this is due to the addition of the main street manager, uh, which added 0.12 FTE. There's a proposed $33,000 increase to personnel services from fiscal year 22 due to the cost of wages and benefits of the main street manager, plus the impacts of the cost of living adjustments proposed earlier. Temp services was removed from the fiscal year 23 budget under materials and services. This is because a main street manager position was added as an in-house position. So uh, the temporary position that was budgeted for last year was removed to offset that. Um, professional services has increased $8,000 for legal services, grant writing and increases on um, existing services like auditing and advertising. You'll notice uh, holiday decorations was added again this year at $15,000, even though if you look in the fiscal year 22 budget column, it looks as though holiday decorations was not budgeted last year. That was a budget amendment item uh, in January of 2022. So fiscal year 22 also budgeted, budgeted for $15,000 towards holiday decorations. Um, then we have our capital outlay budget. So library renovations continue to be budgeted at 500,000 as does the visitor center at 300,000. Grant programs, which now includes the facade program and redevelopment assistant grants was decreased just slightly from 190,000 to 150,000 in this year's budget. Community development and property acquisition line items also decreased slightly and that's so that more funding could be added to the 1975 McPherson property renovations project. And then wrapping up with contingency, it remains at 100,000 and an increase to the unappropriated ending fund balance that's uh, increasing from 119,000 in fiscal year 22 to 264,000 in this proposed budget, which will then carry to fiscal year 24. <clears throat> Now I will take questions if there are any questions. Um, so do we have any public comments or questions to anyone who wishes to speak? <coughs> live to the end of the five minutes that he recorded. Do we have anyone signed up? Okay. Um, so uh, now's the time for the committee to deliberate and decide. Do any members have any questions or comments um, first? I have a few questions. Just for a visual, I just want to understand where these properties are. So the annex is the uh, Sherman Ave, mm -hmm. and it has been determined that it cannot, it has to be demolished. Yes? Um, this, um, it was rendered um, as uh, unusable by the county and that the physical cost outweighed its usefulness, which is why they went and surplus it. And so we had negotiated the purchase of that the two adjacent lots um, for uh, future housing projects in the city. 
And so uh, have we just, do we have to demolish it or not? Do we have to? I'm just uh, curious. No, we can leave know. it there. Um, I mean, um, can it be it refurbished, would, I guess? Is the uh, no. It cannot. Okay. No. Um, okay. The, well, let me take it back. Absolutely. Of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> Except about, um, He's they plan. estimate the crop was here, they tell you two to three times the actual normal cost um, to build new. Okay. Okay. Um, then the second one question I had, the, the visitor information, you're the one talking about as you head in from the north on 101. That, mm -hmm. she's that got a map also has the same problem. Yeah, and I was going to say, if you want to see, oh, uh, she can pull yes. you up on the map where the, yes. so there's, that's like, that's the annex right there off of uh, McPherson in, in Virginia. It's so, a spooky old hospital, dude. Like, <laughs> you know, tear that thing down. Yeah, and I was and born so, there. Yeah, full of <laughs> lots of goodies like asbestos. Lady <laughs> recorder, can you circle the land that we purchased, actually? Just out of case. So it is this building mm -hmm. with the included parking lot along with these two lots. Wow. These two ground yeah. lots. Yeah. Oh, wow. That was a, That's a bonus purchase. That was a bonus purchase. Okay. Um, and then... Um, and then you asked about the visitor center. The visitor center, yeah. And that's just Simpson Park, <coughs> where the new parks department building is. Just that tiny little visitor mm -hmm. center. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. So you know how they said mushrooms were growing on the, 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 the community okay. center. I can only imagine what's growing on the and visitor so, center. And the community center is on Broadway. Yes. That's the, right there. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> or, 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 sorry, that's the visitor center there. Visitor center is here heading into town. Okay. Yeah. Madam Chair, yes. Um, one of your uh, board members has a question. Oh, does everybody know where the boundaries of the Urban Renewal District are? No. Okay. No. Okay. She can Quick show picture. you on the map. Uh, yes. Okay, we go ahead and I'll pull start, it I'll start <laughs> on this talk you through it. You go down to the Mill Casino, and between the Highway 101 and the water, it starts at the Mill Casino and it comes all the way up along the waterfront <coughs> until you get to town here. And it goes up Washington Street by Little Theater on the Bay, and it's been <coughs> to include Little Theater on the Bay. Then it continues up to Union, and then it runs north along Union Avenue to Virginia, and then it goes down Virginia to Safeway. And it's only on the north side of Safeway so down to Marion <laughs> Street. No, that's really interesting. <laughs> so it's a long pony slew there. It goes all the way down to opposite Safeway to Marion Street, goes up where the old Betts building was, and, and then it comes back, hugging Pony Slough, and it comes back into town and it goes to... We've got a good picture. Somewhere, that's somewhere yeah, there. Yeah, that's it. Right yeah, that's wow. it. So, so that's, our, that's where we have to put all... Yeah, money. and it goes really down, it goes along Union down to um, Lincoln Square, then it dives down to the waterfront, basically, and goes along the waterfront wow. and includes the North Point development area. Wow, that's but really then interesting. There's also, um, there, was, there was an amendment sometime back that now includes um, Simpson Park, the developed part of Simpson Park. And that's what led to the new parks um, office building with the, you know, the trunk base mm -hmm. and all that. So I'm seeing that we have a link back to North Ben's homepage. Do we have a link to this? Can, can we get this level of interactivity as a human being out so of the web? This is right off of our website. Oh, all the functional awesome. maps you know, and all the functional awesome. plans are on our website. That's awesome. And so the public can interact with exactly what you're seeing here. And awesome. if you know, is there a plan for the north side, north side yes, of Virginia? Yes. Yeah, north side only. Yeah, well, what are the plans? Can is it can be developed? Is it? No. Well, they can okay. use. Okay, urban renewal. You once you the, the county assessor has to certify your urban renewal boundary when it was established in 1994. It can't be more than 25 percent <laughs> of the assessed valuation of the whole city. Once he certifies that, the there's a frozen base where. You know the library district, the, the airport district, the city, the county, all the different taxing entities only get the money that they were getting right then and there for the next 20 or 30 years until the plan is uh, dissolved, you know, shut down. So they're stuck with getting just that amount of money. The increase in property taxes 
all goes into the urban renewal fund, and that's what we get to play with in urban renewal projects. Now, nothing came in for years and years until the Mill Casino, when on their vacant land north of the casino, they built the high-end RV park. And all of a sudden, that started bringing in like a half a million dollars a year. So now we had money to play with. And that's now that we have money, and it's then our projects are then um, being completed, and the resulting increase in property taxes brings more money into the open renewal um, you know, district yeah. and to our fund that we can then do more with it. Well, my wife and I have only always had two questions. Why do we have two small little driveways going into the north of Virginia and there's nothing there? And why is there no parking downtown? We'd love to go downtown, but I don't walk very far. <laughs> Don't have that answer. So I know. The first question, they were rhetorical, maybe. But. The first question is that a budget question? I, no, it's maybe a rhetorical question. I <laughs> we just drive by Virginia Avenue a lot, and all on the north side, there's nothing other than there's two little driveways with stoplights. Oh, yeah, <laughs> and so going, is, going nowhere. Yeah, so that is in the urban renewal district. And you'll notice that there is a sign out there, the huge for sale sign that says pending. Ah, I didn't notice that. And so pending is in a huge big word. Every large commercial lot in Coos Bay and North Bend is currently either recently closed or is under contract. We have seen more um, money rolling in. So You'll see things happening within the district and things are already happening. The second is just to benefit you. Madam Clerk, if you'll go ahead and pull up the parking map, um, the quickest, fastest way is if you go to the city's main page to the news and go to the archive, um, it happens to be posted there because what we have is a walkability issue. We don't have a parking issue. Um, so if you uh, and then just uh, Click on uh, uh, go up and instead of the uh, the uh, go, I want the archive instead of current. Archive. And then just do the control F and do uh, parking. All right, there you go. And then if you click on your link uh, to the map there, here, there you go. Awesome. That's so good. All right. So the this map shows all of the available parking in all of downtown and in that district. And it shows you where you have the two hour, 12 hour, no limit, 15, 30 RV. <laughs> It'll also show you all the city lots. The Urban Renewal Agency has even bought parking and lots that are available. We don't have a parking issue, we have a walkability issue, or we have a failure to educate folks where these parking lots are, because they are available. And um, the URA recently, I believe in December, closed, for instance, on additional parking for downtown. It's, is that in the green there, Kaylee? Yeah, is that where you're putting? Right. Right. Next to the Mexican restaurant in the man's cave. That's the newest place that's open. That's mm -hmm. what it is, Man Cave 101. Is it open? Yes. yes. Yeah, but you have to enter it northbound. So it is confusing with the one-way streets and it's Whatever. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. It's, a tough, it's there, it's a tough but, ask. Yeah. But, but but it has beautiful walkability on both sides to, to go up, and so it's there. And these other lots that are down here, most folks don't know the lots right up here mm -hmm. on Union, they do exist. So, I'm afraid to ask, what is the man cave thing? <laughs> <laughs> it's my business. Yeah. It has like it has like models and like. Sports memorabilia. Like sports memorabilia. Okay. Old, like Sounds fun. race cars, the miniatures. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. Thank you so much. So, I love the new site, by the way. Where were we on the agenda? Yeah. We so, so read questions at the very end. Um, do we have a first yet on? The, no, we hadn't had a motion yet. We've oh, not had a motion. I was already there. Sorry. We're still, still, you had other questions about urban renewal. 
No, we went through them all. We went through them all. You got um, all your questions? You had some. So. Yes, and they're done. Okay. Um, so, uh, so going once on questions. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Anything? Give me Thirty seconds to consult your notes. No questions, but I'll just make okay. a statement. It's an exciting time, I think, with all the, the development opportunities yes. and the things that the interest we've never seen. I mean, the interest, anybody who works at the cities will say they've had more interest in the last 24 months than there has been in decades. So it's really, it's really exciting. And you'll see, um, you know, you mentioned the, you know, the, 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 the driveway that leads to nowhere. That was a, that was a private developer that had a project that didn't come to fruition, um, but there's, clearly a, a pending sign over there now some other things so i think we'll be able to see a lot of announcements in the next 16 to 12 months so some really cool things happening okay yeah and then um if you also it, it, it feel free if you go to our uh home page yes. um, website um you saw her click on the new site um of course you you can click on there and, and sign up for there but if you go to the new site um you see the get email alerts there, but if you click on more news and then you do what she just did is you click on the archive. Scroll down, you'll actually see um, a Renaissance presentation that the mayor gave at the yes. library that talks a huge amount about what's going on in the district, in the URE district downtown and. Um, uh, it, uh, sometimes I accidentally uh, surprise council members um, <laughs> because, again, you try to get information out, but it's information overload. Um, and this is another great place that the committee can direct people to. If you hear people say like, oh, I'm not on social media, I don't I don't see that stuff. Well, um, things that we post there, we cross post yeah. and put on the website. And I'm presuming, just judging from this format, that this is actually um, the news anyway is actually viewable on a smartphone. It's all mobile yeah. friendly. It's a mobile friendly site. This yeah. is this is one of the council goals. It's like they want to increase the availability of information and accessibility and transparency. And so this new website was launched in response to that. Um, and so and, and and it's it's got more information on there than folks realize. It's it's you know even uh, you know, every council meeting I put out a very lengthy report compiled from all the departments. If you want to really know every two weeks what's going on in the city government, you just go and you look at that report. It's all there. Yeah. Um, there's nothing secretive. And then if you don't see something, you know, we have this little button that says report a concern, but you can also just ask questions um, or you can contact um, uh, myself or the staff and so I'll gladly answer the question. We have some folks that, you know, call. 10, 12 times a week. <laughs> Thank well, okay. you. That's great. That is so awesome. <clears throat> uh, so does anyone wish to make a motion? We have a suggestion for that motion, uh, a little piece of paper with just a few lines. If someone would make a motion to approve the budget as proposed. Or, or is it supposed to be a committee person? You yeah, are a committee person. All right. Um, I move that we approve the urban renewal budget as proposed in the amount of three million seven hundred and ninety thousand dollars and approve the tax rate at the highest amount allowable. Any seconds? Sorry. Uh, okay. okay, and then uh, shall yeah. we first a second and then discussion. Any discussion? I think it sounds like a fabulous idea. <laughs> uh, shall we vote? Yeah. All in favor, aye. 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 Uh, all opposed, nay. The motion carries to accept the budget. Thank you. 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 Thank